You're listening to the Plane Talking UK podcast, the UK-based podcast written by a passenger for anyone. And here are your hosts, <coughs> Carlos Stevings, Matt Smith and Neville Bounds. Well, hello and welcome to episode number 183 of the Plane Talking UK podcast. I'm Carl Stebbings and joining me is my first co-host, as always this week in the kitchen studio, it's Matt Smith. Well, hello everyone. How are we? How are we? Oh, we're good. We're good. I'm yeah. feeling quite festive today. Look, I'm actually festive? wearing my... Festive? Uh, well, well, well. <laughs> I'm, wearing my AP, I'm wearing my APG t-shirt today because obviously, okay, uh, yeah. yes, we've got a little, a little, little thing to, to look forward to a little bit later on where uh, yeah. uh, there's a little meetup, APG meetup going on in Berlin. In Berlin. Mm. and we'll be cutting across live to them later on in the show. So I'm wearing the T-shirt in honour. Uh, Dr. Stefan is there along with loads of other people. So, uh, oh. yeah, a, a real treat. So, yeah, I'm wearing the T-shirt in honour. Well yeah, done. Absolutely. Well done. You, however, are not, I see. No, you I'm use, wearing a normal aviation <laughs> T-shirt as per... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, your, and your silly hat, yes. That yes. silly TriStar Very, thing. That, yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> and joining us uh, again, as always, is our other wonderful co-host of the show. It is Sir Neville Bounds. Hello. Hello, Nev. Oh, we've been Hello, lovely. guys. Yes, I have uh, defied gravity once again <laughs> and returned from Washington safely <gasps> on the on the bin liner. Yeah, I'm, I'm on, say, on the, I was a bin liner. How very dare! I, I'm very excited actually because you actually flew by. Um, I have to ask the question obviously because when, whenever we talk to Brian, which is I'm delighted to say quite frequently, <laughs> uh, he very rarely says nice things about the airline that you flew with. Uh, you didn't fly United, did you, Nev? I did, <gasps> and yeah. I think that United did quite well on the long haul sectors, but not so well on the short haul. I think that's right. Brian's um, main complaint. Really. Okay. But the uh, the long haul from Washington to Heathrow was very reasonable uh, last Saturday, I have to say, okay. and oh. uh, very comfortable indeed. I, I was have it... to ask the question: Which area of the aeroplane were you actually? Oh, were you yeah. were you in were you yes, in Muggle well, class or the, were cl- you... the client was only flying me cheap, uh, but I upgraded <laughs> myself to the business class. So okay. I got one of their oh, nice oh, flat bed right. uh, okay, seats, and that made a big difference because I got about three hours sleep, and it was uh, <laughs> well, wow. I was actually in reasonable shape on on, on the Saturday when I got back. I so uh, See, I was going to take the daytime flight, but the daytime flight was on a seven five seven, and we're not going to do the North Atlantic. We're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about. 757s and and, tr- and crossing the Atlantic. Matt, no, 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 uh, both directions. Uh, unlike U.S. immigration on the way in, though. Oh, <gasps> oh really? Ooh. Oh, did they find out about? No. Wow. Well, uh, <laughs> as I mentioned, I, I last went to Washington in 1994. Then it took <laughs> oh. them two and a half hours. <laughs> okay. to, to get through. This okay. year it was only two hours, so they've shaved right. half an hour. Shaved half time. In, in, wow. in, in many many years, which is great yeah. news. Yes, absolutely. Well, I'm glad they let you in because we obviously enjoyed having you uh, to sort yeah. of Skype in last week on it's the show and, live uh, from yeah, foreign it was parts. Good. Yes. Yeah, from foreign so, parts. Yeah. Do, do you think the immigration issue is possibly because of some of those funky stickers that you have on your passport because of locations you've been to? It didn't help, but I think. <laughs> the fact that we had 750 people uh, uh, come in and only four desks uh, to process people Ooh. may have oh. been a contributory oh, dear. factor. Really? Okay. Oh, and this was Washington Dulls, wasn't it? Uh, yes, Washington Dulls. Yeah, yes. that's what I call it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Washington Dulls Airport. And oh, yeah. Yes. Oh. So, uh, anyway, enough of this. We'll we get probably emails should... coming in. Yeah, the, <laughs> the abuse now, will know, be forthcoming. Yeah. I think Send we've... all emails to Matt Smith. Uh, all right, yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I think we should I think we yeah. should introduce our special guests. So, we have got two incredibly special guests joining us on the show tonight and uh, they are the hosts of they're actually laughing when you're saying <laughs> i don't know why <laughs> they are the they are the uh, they are the fantastic hosts of uh, an awesome podcast which i've been listening to myself for quite some time now and um it's for anyone who's an airbus lover you've got to check out these guys mm-hmm. and it's the a320 yeah. podcast mm-hmm. and uh, so welcome on to the show matt and andy hello hello thanks very much for having us you hey. don't need to look quite so frightened. <laughs> Honestly, it's fine. It's, it's fine. We're, we're quite You're friendly. Friends. <laughs> we're all friends here. So, ha- yeah. how are you guys been? I guess I guess you're having some uh, some time off from flying, are you? Or are you uh, back back into flying tomorrow? Yeah, oh. no, we're both off. Yeah, I've got five days off now, which is unusual, but nice. Yeah, likewise, we just had some leave, so I'm just off for a few days. Hence, why we're both in the same room at the same time for a change. <laughs> 
Oh. That, that is a rare thing. It's, it's, I, I, sometimes I wish I could do the same because I'm a bit... I'm, I seem to be forever in the kitchen studio. But anyway, that's, uh, <gasps> that's you know... Oh, what do you mean? Oh, hello. <laughs> that's, that's me sacked. Okay. Good. <laughs> oh, Gemma says I can stay. That's fine. Oh, that's yeah. really, oh dear, yeah. I, I'm going to come stay with you, you, Nev, I think, for next week's show. I think that's the way forward. <laughs> you, you're very welcome, mate. Thank I'm you sorry. very much. I anyway. shall be here. But uh, you right. can come stay with <laughs> oh, even better. <laughs> Okay. Right. That's so, uh, all part of the fun. Sorry. So yes. again, a huge thanks uh, to you, uh, Matt and Andy, for joining us. And uh, you're going to uh, you're going to give us ha- give us a hand with this week's news stories. And uh, we're going to have a chat with you as well later yep. on in the show about uh, about how you how you got to where you are now in yeah. the aviation yeah, industry. Looking, looking forward to it. Excellent. Fantastic. So we're going to say a big thanks to everyone who's joined us in the live chat room this evening. We've got uh, loads of names in there. Mark Harvey, Liz Piper, Jenny Parkinson. Hello over there in Rome. Uh, Thomas Mandrakey, Andy Furlong is also in the chat room this oh, wow. week. Hello, hello, Andy. Andy. Hello. Uh, Barbara Parrish, uh, Thomas Mandrake, well, Neville Bounds. Never heard yeah. of him. No. Uh, <laughs> Cheryl Mandrakey as well. She's also in the chat room. Mm. Uh, where are we? Scrolling down the list here. Main Man Micah, our blue spanner of death. Uh, Main Man Micah. Easy. Jen Niffer. Yes. She's also in the chat room as well. I'm just scrolling through the list. Hope I didn't miss anyone out. I hope I don't. Anyway. Probably. Probably, <laughs> I know. Shorty Cosgrove, not forgetting Shorty. And also uh, Rick Bell is in the yeah, chat room as well. So hello to you, Rick Bell, the yeah. legend that is. So uh, we are going to start the show then, as we do each week, with our rundown of the weekly news from around the world and the UK. So if you're ready, Matt. I am, yes. And if you're ready, Nev. Perfectly. And Matt and Andy, <laughs> are you ready to go? Yeah, ready. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> so, kicking off this week's first news story, this one is on the ChicagoBusiness.com. And uh, the headline is Boeing lands $11 billion 787 deal. And this story came online today. And uh, it's uh, Turkish Airlines has said it intends to purchase 40 of Boeing 787-9 Dreamliners. A long-awaited deal that signals the carrier's rebound following a terrorist attack on its Istanbul hub last year. When finalised, the order will be valued at almost $11 billion before the customary discounts for large aircraft purchases. The pact, unveiled uh, during a brief signing ceremony in New York late Thursday, came after years of market studies and negotiations for wide-body planes as the airline plotted its expansion. Uh, Boeing's carbon composite Dreamliner will help upgrade Turkish's fleet of long-range aircraft as it competes with other Middle Eastern airlines amid slowing growth in the region. The carrier's expansion would hasten uh, President uh, Recap Tayyip's arrogance goal of making Istanbul (laughs) one of the world's premier (laughs) air travel hubs. The airline already has 75 Boeing 737 MAX jets on order, according to the plane maker's website. Turkish plans to shift operations from Istanbul's Atatürk airport to a new hub, which is due to open next year. It's very exciting for them, and it will open so many new gateways, said Marty Bentrot. Boeing's Vice President of Sales for the Middle East, Russia and Central Asia. These airplanes are part of that growth plan. Boeing climbed less than 1% to $257.90 at 9.42 a.m. in New York. Turkish was a little changed at 9.2 liras. So this is a, obviously a huge deal mm. uh, for yeah. uh, for Boeing, obviously having this uh, amount of orders for the uh, for the Dash 9. I'm, I'm, mm-hmm. That's quite interesting that they chose a Dash 9 because it's slightly stretched more longer than the uh, the dash eight um but uh, turkish is getting to be quite uh, one of those um uh more larger kind of uh, airlines more, more in, in, the, in the kind of area well it's you know it's it's you know it's one of those airlines that is getting very popular now, i'm just I mocking your english i'm like <laughs> thanks <laughs> thanks i know <laughs> Because uh, Turkish actually do do a very, very, very reasonably cheap fare from the UK to Dubai, which is okay. a very popular destination, right. um, with a stop um, in uh, in Turkey on okay. the way there. Mm. But they do do an incredibly cheap fare to get to Dubai, which is um, okay. half and that, the and price that's on a dash of Emirates. On, that's on a, on uh, a that's actually on one of their seven three seven eight hundreds. That is wow. Uh, really go all yeah. that way on it? Wow. Well, no, it's, no it's, 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 a, it's a stop <laughs> halfway there, but yeah, they do do uh, do do a really cheap. That sounds fare very similar that. to the seven. Seven five seven three hundred. I don't know if that came <laughs> up in conversation <laughs> at all. Like not. Uh, no. Okay. What do you think of this, then, Nev? <laughs> well, it's good news, isn't it? And I think uh, Turkish. I think they've been underestimated in 
uh, previously. And uh, good to see that there's, doing, there's some more routes going on there. And um, mm. Dr. Steph was saying that the airport is enormous there. So it's a, obviously a very central hub between uh, Europe and the Middle East. So it's a very important uh, connecting airport, I would mm. say. So the yeah, more okay. new equipment that's going on there, uh, the better. Got to, got to be a good thing. So, Matt, it? Andy, yeah. you had any dealings at all with uh, with that with the airline at all? Uh, not with Turkish, but you do see them more and more, especially the big hubs that we fly into. They're flying a lot of aircraft about now. Especially, um, I was in down Barcelona the other day, and I noticed that they were flying a triple seven in there from uh, oh, wow. Istanbul. Uh-huh. Yeah, so they must be they must be doing <clears throat> quite well. So I can see why they've gone for this uh, this big order. Yeah, yeah. As far as my way, I think Turkish Airlines have the most routes of any airline in the world. Actually, I think. I wouldn't, uh, do you know what? That wouldn't actually me, surprise yeah, me because yeah. it is quite a it's quite a central country for a lot of things, isn't it? So mm. you you yeah. can use it as a hub to get virtually a anywhere, stone. can't you? Yeah, it's yeah. a good stepping stone. Yeah, they they actually went through. They modernised quite a lot of their um, the passenger experience part of their aircraft. Ooh, not so long ago, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bit up, they uh, yeah they kind of upgrade a lot of their um, economy and stuff uh, yeah. um, seats on the aircraft. So yeah, it's. Um, it's good. You have mm. to you have, definitely have to check out the uh, the uh, flights though, because they mm. do have some very reasonable flights um, yeah. out of the UK to uh, to some destinations. So, so yeah. yeah, we're going to move on. And uh, basically, unless you've been stuck under a stone somewhere anywhere Ooh, in the world, the I next think, really. story. The next story is one that because obviously Ryanair is always story number two on this show, and I always seem to end up with a job <laughs> of reading it. Uh, and uh, I think you've had to say it's not a nice story this week. So this is on the independent.co.uk, their website, and the headline, as I say, unless you've been stuck under a stone, won't come as a surprise to you Ryanair may force pilots to change holiday plans amid flight cancellation debacle and that certainly is a very appropriate word I think for this current mess Ryanair may force some pilots to change their holiday plans in an effort to limit the fallout from the mass cancellations across its sprawling fleet at its general shareholders meeting on Thursday Europe's largest low-cost airline said that pilots were this week offered a bonus of up to 12,000 euros that's 10,600 pounds to work 10 extra days to combat a huge staff shortage that has resulted in around 2,000 flight cancellations so far Uh, Chief Executive Michael O Leary also said that pilots had collectively offered to work an extra 2,500 days since the crisis broke. A spokesperson for the company told The Independent that 125 new pilots had been hired in the past fortnight as a part of an ongoing recruitment drive. Mr O'Leary also denied reports that some pilots had rejected the extra cash and demanded more favourable contracts instead. He said that the pilots had not threatened industrial action. Several Ryanair pilots have contacted the independent with their accounts of the causes that will have no doubt got them into an awful lot of trouble because I understand that Ryanair people aren't allowed to have anything to do with the media so never mind Uh, and consequences of the issue in recent days with one saying that online groups are forming and unifying to get Ryanair to make improvements unlike other airlines Ryanair is uh, um, is almost completely non-unionized with an unusual arrangement uh, whereby some pilots are indirectly contracted through limited companies. Ooh, that sounds a bit strange. Anyway, in uh, order to cope with the fallout from the recent debacle, Mr. O'Leary on Thursday said that the group is now planning to reclaim one week of its pilots' holidays to prevent any further disruption. Good luck with that. So I'm not going to read the story uh, any further. It's safe to say it's been a challenging week. It's been a challenging week, I think, for Mr. O'Leary. And I think it's safe to say that uh, certain other low-cost airlines have been well and truly um, (laughs) jumping on the bandwagon (laughs) with... I think one of the funniest things I I said was... was it's Michael O'Deary, wasn't it? I think it was <laughs> that one was of the, the um, funniest. Yeah, things. Eurowings. Yeah, Eurowings. Yeah. That's right. I think it's one of the funniest adverts I've seen in in a long, long time. I mean, we've, but, we've uh, obviously got we've got two two uh, pilots here who both work for a large European uh, airline here. Yeah. I mean, how how many days holiday uh, do you get, say, uh, as pilots for for an airline? Twenty five. Yeah, we it? get we get twenty five. So it's actually not any different from, from me me just being an office boy, basically. I mean, mm. your holiday entitlement is no greater uh, than mine. I mean, I, I have a contract that enables me to have 25 days as well. So there's not really, yeah. you know, it's, it's, you, you're, you're treated in that respect like uh, ordinary well, ordinary employees, <laughs> if you can be exactly. such things yeah. as pilots. Yeah. But, uh, but it's, it's very different. We have a bidding system. Mm-hmm. And uh, each year, depending on what holiday you got the year before, so say you've got summer leaves, that's got really high points, it's all based on a point system. 
So the higher your points are at the end of the year, the lower down the list you are for the following year. Right. Okay. So the chances of getting some summer holiday or Christmas off is right. pretty slim. Mm. And I, I don't worry, we don't understand the system either. Yeah, the system is <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's the same in most airlines, and yeah. it's crazy how it works. Yeah, but I was just going to say that actually, that that is very similar. I know from when we've spoken to other pilots and stuff, that is, um, I know I know uh, Acme. Uh, airlines operate a similar system don't they and, and it's your seniority if you like if you've been there a long time you stand a much better chance of getting the holiday that you want if you've you know worked for the same airline for a long time so is it, is it a I case think thing? have a slightly different system where i think they're forced to take leave in the winter right so yeah. they're given three weeks or a month off in the winter that they have to take and i think what they're doing is they're changing this compulsory leave in their winter I, think that's I mean, I, the the only thing I would say it, 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 with this story, and we will sort of we'll move on, I think, because we could go on about it for ages. Mm. But I, I do for think what yeah, well, indeed for a long, long time, uh, the, the only thing that uh, that <clears throat> makes alarm bells ring in my head is that the the schedulers and organisers must have known that this was going to happen. I mean, this must have been clear to them that it was very much on the cards for quite a long period of time. I'm surprised they sort of waited until the brown stuff hit yeah. the fan, really, before they appeared to start doing something about it. I, don't, I, I, I mean, don't... I, I would, and I would guess probably there's quite a few airlines in the world, certainly in Europe, that mm. aren't that far away from being in the same situation themselves. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that's a fair comment. It's, mm. um, my, yeah. It's... My favourite quote of this whole story is that... Right, that Michael O'Leary seems to have live in a different universe where he can yes. employ a pilot and have them online in two weeks. It's yeah. pretty impressive. I don't know how <laughs> yeah, you do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's it... a good 12 to 15 weeks to get a pilot from recruitment to, to on the line, let alone finish their training. Well, so yes, it's quite absolutely. impressive. And, of course, there may be type rating issues that need to be dealt yeah, with well, as well. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there could be all so, manner yeah. of things that, that need to be dealt with before they mm. go online, as, as, as he says. But then yeah. I, I think, think I might give uh, Michael a shout, so if he'll do a, uh, <laughs> an interview with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good luck with that, Sanev. Um, you know, Best you're a great. With that, yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah. Downloads would definitely go through yeah, the roof. Then, absolutely, right? I think yeah. so. Yeah, I think even the BBC might be interested in our show then. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a, it's a bit of a. It's, I think it's safe to say it's a bit of a mess, really. And uh, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn when I say that he does seem to live in a different world to everyone else. As as, as uh, I, th I think it's uh, we might, might just mention as well. You know, it is a, a pretty naff story as well for for, for the pilot yeah. or for the for the crews mm. and stuff. But also, yeah. you know, we, we can't forget the past passengers who have been affected by it as well because yes. there's been a lot of passengers affected by this there has um, yeah. a lot of the stories which have hit the news and stuff mm -hmm. and um, but I think after an article I read this afternoon online that um, there's going to be a lot of compensation um, it's for, going to cost them a lot people. of money it's going to cost them a lot of which, money um, which will yeah. definitely not please Mr O'Leary well, in the lightest <laughs> yeah and he has been quite shrewd really because the EU uh, 261 real estate if your flight is cancelled with more than two weeks notice they don't have to pay you anything right yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so it's only really that like when it first started if you like where people were only getting yeah. a few days notice um, that's it yes you know, it's so the first two weeks they'll get the compensation and everybody after that for the remaining month because because they've been told they're not they just they can have a refund on their flight but no compensation yeah mm. yeah well i mean he's you know the, say what you like about them he's not completely <laughs> stupid is he uh, let's be honest but uh yeah so anyway, so, moving on yeah. to the next story <laughs> yeah, okay. and uh this uh the ne next story is uh, a, a quite a, a rubbish story really for uh, for now is it mm. oh okay <laughs> oh dear uh, this is on the clean technica.com <laughs> website a website that i've got saved to my favorites so obviously <laughs> i can imagine not. yes absolutely <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do worry about when you know when you're trawling the internet like normal uh, men. Uh, Excuse me, I, I, I spend <laughs> I spend uh, ages going through the internet trying to get stories each week for the show. And, yes, you know, okay, it, and, it, and, it, and it's are... all aviation related. I trust. It's, of course, <laughs> right? Okay. Anyway, just looking for the delete history. <laughs> of button. course. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, mo it. Moving on, <laughs> and it says that British Airways is partnering with the renewables fuel firm Velocis on a new program that will see household waste converted into jet fuel to a number of specially designed waste processing facilities, according to a press release on the matter. And the renewable jet fuel will then be used by British Airways fleet of commercial aircraft. The program is intended to help the company become more sustainable and is part of a previously developed long-term plan relating to that goal and also to the goal of reducing its net emissions by 50% by the year 2050. The first of these new household waste to jet fuel facilities will be able to convert hundreds of thousands of tons of material that would otherwise be headed to the landfill or incinerator 
Canada into jet fuel, according to the company. And the press release says that the planned plant will produce enough fuel to power all British Airways 787 Dreamliner operated flights from London to San Jose, California, New Orleans, uh, uh, sorry, New Orleans in, uh, Louisiana, in Louisiana for a whole year. And it will be the first plant of this scale. The airline plans to supply its aircraft fleet with increasing amounts of sustainable jet fuel in the next decade. The jet fuel produced at the plant will deliver more than 60% greenhouse gas reduction compared with conventional fossil fuel, delivering 60,000 tonnes of CO2 savings every year. This will contribute to uh, both global carbon emissions reductions and local air quality improvements around major airports. During the past week, the Department for Transport has published changes to the Renewable Transport Fuels Obligation, RTFO, for the first time, and sustainable jet fuel will be included in the incentive scheme. These changes to the RTFO are designed to promote sustainable aviation, and once implemented they are expected to provide long-term policy support for this market that makes the timing of the announcement very surprising does it not a graph aside gaining some limited or otherwise self-sufficiency as regards jet fuels probably makes a lot of sense for the uk considering that the north sea oil industry is now in the process of completely falling apart and uh, iag's ceo uh, willie walsh commented on the announcement because sustainable fuels will play an increasingly critical role in global aviation and we are preparing for that future. Turning household waste into jet fuel is an amazing innovation that produces clean fuel whilst reducing landfill. Whilst that may be true, I think that air travel will now become more expensive and much less common within 20 or 30 years than it is now. That's quite an interesting comment, isn't it? But there's a lot of, lot of uh, uh, move towards sustainability. And, of course, one of the uh, uh, aviation world's biggest costs is fuel, fuel mm, unfortunately. Yeah. Yes. I mean, do, do you think this is really a viable plan, though? I mean, it seems... I think it's it's definitely in, in its infancy. I think it's going to be a little yeah. while before we start mm. to see, you know, thousands of commercial jets flying around, around the world being powered by, well waste yeah um, but although they have been testing biofuels now for quite mm, some yes, time they have, which yeah, yeah. Um, from what i've read is has been going really well mm. um but uh, it's in fact yeah. there's actually a biofuel plant it's uh, uh, near my near uh, lambert's isn't yeah, there it where is, i was yeah. working before yeah. there's a, yeah. a sort of gas plant and stuff which i think was originally there because they used to have some gas buses didn't they i think i think, sort of I think, start, think any yeah. i think most airlines try and kind of um reduce their carbon mm. footprint or to, to be more greener yeah um going green cue the music <laughs> if you're an apg um yeah. but uh, okay, yeah yeah it's it's interesting we can't nick BA, all of their I ideas know. all right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i think i think it's quite good that uh, ba are kind of um pioneering this i think yeah you say yeah it's, absolutely uh, it's good what what matt andy come on what do you guys think of uh, flying your your airbuses powered by um uh, household waste well, I think it's a great idea because I've just worked out while you're talking through it then. Uh, yesterday, on a four sector day out, I burnt through 18 tonne of fuel. Oh, my goodness <laughs> me, yes. Okay. That's, that's, that, that wasn't fuel loaded on the aircraft, that was the actual burn for the yep. day. Okay. Mm. Um, yeah. So, and that's one aircraft, one, one day out, really. Yeah. And, you know, some airlines have got fleets of 200, 300 yeah. aircraft. So you can see how it mounts up very quickly. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I mean, um, is it sustainable? It's definitely though? the future. Oh, it's definitely. Yeah, there's plenty of household waste. Well, yeah, <laughs> but is there enough? Exactly. I mean, when you start converting, and, and of course, there's the one thing that really bothers me with all of these stories. Oh, the thing I know that, what you're going to say. They, how they, much does it cost to convert to this? Cost stuff? to convert it. How yeah. much energy is required to kickstart mm. the process in the first place? Yeah. To actually um, sort of generate this fuel, because I know it's like hydrogen is one of the most, you know, these H2O cars. They're basically where you just get water come out of the exhaust pipe. That's fine, but the en the energy required to to do that split in the first place is so huge that you almost wonder whether it's you know worth it i know there's like i remember watching a program in some desert somewhere where they were using the sun as a way of kick-starting this this whole this whole sort of hydrogen producing um sort of process but uh, i mean is is that going to have are we going to have similar issues here where you're actually burning an alarming amount of energy if you like to just create the fuel in the first mm. place I, I don't know what um it's uh, like i said it's it's new stuff you know it's not going to mm. be you know anything there's not going to be anything happening no, massive no, indeed. You know, but i mean for, in principle it's a, yeah. a fantastic it's idea it's a great idea, idea. I, I, it's a great I, idea. I hope it uh, sorts itself out yeah so next story is on the bbc.co.uk website 
and uh, quite an interesting one if you've got a few quid laying around or some money right. uh, that's fell down behind the back of your sofa. Okay. Uh, hey, you've just uh, got to win the Euro Millions tonight and you're well, there. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> Why, what's the total at now then? Oh, God. 134 Ooh, million. Is that en- oh, it's enough. I think. Okay. Is it? Yeah. Is it? Oh, oh right. Carlos is Quick. beside it's himself. Yeah. More than <laughs> enough. Yeah. So the uh, the headline then. Uh, Boeing. Especially for a Boeing. Yeah. Oh, no. Anyway, sorry. Boeing. Or should yeah. I say Boeing in, in honour of Sir Captain? We should Nick. we should add uh, add Captain Nick in on this story. Yeah, this, okay. Uh, right. This is a. Uh, Boeing 747s offered for public auction in China. Okay. So, uh, ever wanted to own your own private jet? Not well, really, quite no. this size, but oh, right. uh, <laughs> that may be now possible given that a number are now up for auction in China. Okay. Uh, the three Boeing 747s that, that uh, have landed on the auction arm of Taobao. Taobao? Taobao. Right. Okay. Taobao. Excellent. China's leading eBay-like service. Oh. Uh, the <laughs> planes have been in storage at the uh, cities of Shanghai and Shenzhen since 20... 2013, after their owner, Jade Cargo International, filed for bankruptcy in September that year. They were seized by court in the southern city of Shenzhen, but never found uh, buyers despite being offered previously in six offline auctions. According to the Yangcheng Evening Post, this is the first time that the wow. uh, courts have offered a Boeing aircraft to the public for an online auction. Sadly, you'll need deep pockets to afford one of these jets because opening bids for the aircraft range from 122 to 135 million yuan, or 18.5 I thought to that was yen. Or yen. It is yen. <laughs> 18 and a half or 20.4 million dollars, or if you're in the UK here, 13.7 million to 15.1 million If you're watching pounds. on uh, YouTube, ladies and gentlemen, I have just popped up the uh, the the, uh, the eBay-like listing, shall we say. I mean, so, if you can read that, you're a better man than I am. It has to be said. Google Translate. <laughs> right, uh, okay. So yeah. Taobao directs potential buyers to make a security deposit for the planes before 20th of October, and bids formally close on the 20th of November. Now, bear in mind, these are cargo versions of the 747, so, okay. I mean, you could um, use them to, to to live in, I suppose, really. I mean, posh right. house. Okay. I mean, it um, seems a bit of a shame not to sort of fly them. Yeah, uh, even if it is a Boeing. But if you if you had the chance to fly them, you, I mean, you'd, you'd skip having to pay council tax for the local authorities because you could just fly them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, move uh, them every so often. No stamp duty. Well, no, there is exactly. That. I mean, it's an unusual approach. I mean, it could work. It's <laughs> like an, it, it'd be like having an incredibly expensively posh caravan. Right. Uh, now, excuse me. I like my caravan. There's no need to <laughs> just look here. Yeah. I am, I, and I accept I'm the one holding everyone up on the main road. But that's not the end there. So, uh, yes. so I mean, okay. I mean, Nev. I suppose you've you've already put a deposit down on one of these uh, aircraft. Oh. Nev? And naturally, yes. I'm just looking at the shape of the whole thing. It's uh, extraordinary, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yes. But, I mean, I, um, what would you do with one, sir? Well, obviously, I think I would. Never. For, for me, I think I would probably use it for um, part of the business that I, I work for and, and that, that yes. kind of stuff, if, yeah. if I had the money. Yes, of course. Uh, but uh, no, it's extraordinary, isn't it? And um, It could be your yeah, new it, studio, sir. So. There you go. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Indeed. Well, that is true, yes. And, and, and the company you work for, I mean, I'm amazed they don't have their own private jet, you know. There is a, There are one or two people uh, in our business that do have their own private jets. Really? And, oh, wow. uh, and retained pilots. Uh, I can think one uh, one down at uh, Fair Oaks Airport. Okay. And um, uh, they are, every time they put their prices up, they're in for massive ridicule <laughs> because of the, uh, uh, the right. jet that they run okay. and the two retained pilots that they have as well. So, well, that's uh, true. But, uh, yeah. I can, I can yeah. actually say that the aircraft, the three in question, are all 400 variants of the 747. They are the okay. 400 oh, series. Okay. And they're all powered by the GE CF6 ATC2 uh, engines as well. So, uh, mm. yeah, get yourself a bargain. Hop over there to, uh, what was the <laughs> website? Ta- Taobao. Taobao. Yeah, if, you, if you say yeah. so. Yes, yeah, so easy for you Matt, to say. Matt and yeah. Andy, I guess you you guys have already got one of these on back order. Yeah, yeah, being considerate. I mean, this is my dream to sort of tip one of these. I'll, I'll cut the centre tank out and turn it into a swimming pool. <laughs> I like that's it. That's been yes. done. I that, think that's that's been... that is a sensible thing. Oh, right. no, they've got one of these converted into a, 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 a slide, you know, the, the pool slide things. Pool slide thing, okay. Yeah, you right. know what I mean. The yeah, okay. Aqua park. An that's aqua park, it. right. So okay. I'm sure someone in, somewhere in the world has converted one of these into an aqua park okay. with slides and stuff. Right, as you do. Seems perfectly normal. I know. Um, well, okay. Just blow one of the emergency exit slides. It's already there. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is true. 
true. <laughs> that is true. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't, you're not going to get told off for setting it off either. It has to be said. But, so, there we are, opening the door when you shouldn't. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, moving swiftly on. Yeah. Okay. The next story. This is on yet another website that I don't know where he's found. That's the Bloom- Bloomberg Business Week, whatever one of those is. Uh, and the headline: It's a bad time to be a big jet. Mm. For the better part of a decade, the skies have grown increasingly hostile with jumbo jets such as Boeing's 747 and Airbus's A380. Now the fuel efficient planes intended to replace those behemoths are also encountering resistance. Uh, Interest in Boeing's 777X, a revamped version of its uh, biggest wide body set to begin deliveries in 2020, is flagging. And in recent weeks, United Airlines and Cathay Pacific Airways together have scratched 41 orders um, for the Airbus A350-1000, a twin aisle plane uh, designed to carry about 370 passengers, leaving Airbus with only 171 orders for the model. We're seeing sluggish demand for the biggest planes. Uh, Stephen, uh, name who I'm not even going to pr- attempt to pronounce. Anyway, Stephen, who is the chairman of the US jet financing giant Air Lease Corp, said on a conference call in August. So that I mean that's a sort of a, a sort of slightly disappointing story, really. So the problem is that the jet fuel is cheap, five hundred and fifty dollars per metric ton. Mm, it's lovely, <laughs> really cheap. Uh, down forty percent from uh, 2014. At that price, it's profitable for an airline to continue operating older wide-body models that launched in the 1990s, such as the Airbus A330 and Boeing's original 777, and delay purchases of more efficient planes like the A350, which has a fuselage and wings made from lightweight carbon fibre. Even if crude prices uh, rebound, sales of the big jets might not fully recover, says Nick Cunningham, who's an analyst at the Agency Partners LLC in London. That's because airlines are shifting from channeling traffic through mega hubs towards non-stop routes between second-tier cities using smaller twin aisle planes as the market evolves in, in f- uh, to favour direct flights and higher frequencies. It could be that the A350-1000 and the 777X are needed in smaller numbers, M- Mr Cunningham says. So it's mm, so looking at a sad at, um, story, really. Uh, the 777X. Now, the 777X was launched at the Dubai Air Show. reason why so many of our stories are sort of Boeing-related when we have two Airbus pilots with us. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> well, that, they can say how, how much better the Airbus Of course, right. Okay, fair enough. But uh, no, Boeing, <laughs> Boeing released, uh, they launched the 777X at the Dubai Air Show in 2013. Yeah. So that's how many years ago, 2013? That was uh, uh, November 2013. Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah, nearly... That's five. Five, five years, yeah, yeah. nearly five years ago, yeah. and to date, uh, Boeing have got orders for three hundred and twenty-six. Mm. It's funny is, though, isn't it? We quite yeah. often say that it's like Airbus did very well at the Paris Air Show, didn't they? Oh, yeah, uh, over yeah. Boeing, and yeah. yet now actually, you know, it's sort of it's sort of evening itself out a bit, really. I think. I it, think. I think the narrow body market is so much more bigger for for Airbus so much and more Boeing. What is the matter with your English this <laughs> No, larger. <laughs> it's the air, no, the so no, much more bigger. Right. The, the market <laughs> oh, for wow. the market for the narrow body jets yeah. is, is far more. Greater, yeah, it's far, far for greater. the larger yeah. aircraft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we've talked about this before on on previous episodes, with obviously the the seven four sevens being yes. retired, mm, um, yeah, yeah. and also the A three forties are also they're also starting to be retired from various airlines. And like we said in a few weeks back, the A three eighty they're starting mm. to get a bit. You know, the airlines are kind of starting to go. I mean, more I, I, I use the coaching industry as an example only because it's something that I have experienced. But the, the 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 dream, if you like, with most coach companies is that actually they aim to have vehicles that are no more than ten years old. Mm. I'm surprised, like airlines, perhaps don't have. I mean, obviously, the cost involved in buying an aeroplane is you know mm. huge yeah but uh, i'm surprised if you like that 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 some airlines don't sort of adopt that same model where they try and have uh, you know craft that are sort of say less than 15 years old i don't know is is is, is that is is there uh, i may as well throw this at, at our, our pilots here the i mean is is that a a target that a- airlines aim for or is it more about fuel efficiency and and things like yeah, that i mean our airline Certainly, they set an age limit to their aircraft, and they sell them off when they get to a certain age and buy new ones in. The mm. the key is cycles, right? For well, the short haul aircraft, especially low cost. Uh, what was the aircraft I was on yesterday? That was eleven years old, and it had thirty two thousand cycles on it. Right. Whereas uh, a seven four seven that's been flying around for thirty years might just have that amount of cycles on it. Mm. So I guess. The short haul stuff wears out a lot quicker. That's where they get rid of them. But maybe the, the long haul guys. I mean, look at BE with their 
their 747s, some of their uh, 400s are really getting on now. Yeah. Uh, but they still, they still got the life in the air for him. Mm. Nev's Nev's crying. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I mean th- those 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 seven four seven four hundreds have, have still got a lot of life left in them. I think because they've just gone through a, a big refurbishment program as well, and mm. uh, they're planning on flying those into into the twenty twenties. I think. And of course, they they've paid for them years ago. So yeah. But mm. of course, the, um, the the trend towards multi engine aircraft, in other words, you know, more than two, more than two is, yeah. is reducing somewhat, especially on the North Atlantic routes. But they seem to be able to uh, make them work. Because because the, uh, the aircraft are relatively cheap um, but, uh, I because mean, uh, the capital cost has been paid for. As, as you say, though, I mean, as, and again, as they're saying in this story, of course, um, because the price of fuel, if you like, has gone down dramatically, it is actually, you know, making the four engine, the ones that they've already bought and paid for, if you see what I mean, are, are suddenly more cost effective because the, the fuel price is so much lower. They're not gaining much by, you know, spending out all this money on, on the, on the yeah. newer, lighter airframes, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Also, the big sort of mix up to the the whole industry is the 321 Neo because it's got a 4,000 mile range. Wow, that's really shaken everything up because you can cross the Atlantic with one of these now. Mm. Yeah, and they're obviously much smaller and cheaper to run. Mm. Yeah, but not true. quite as comfortable. Nice Airbus <laughs> reference. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously you can fly those on the standard 320 family, so mm. airlines are able to stretch their legs without having to retrain their pilots. Good point. Yeah, but the pas- yeah. the passengers aren't though. Able to stretch. Well, that's, no, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that, I don't care about them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we don't worry about those. You know, it's just cattle, isn't it? It's. Uh, I always call it cattle class. You know, it's, it's just one of those. Just but, in reference to the live chat, Barbara Parrish has said, uh, "Do we have our own A320 that we fly around the world like John Travolta?" I wish. <laughs> I wish we did, and I also wish that we had enough money to burn 18 tons of fuel yesterday. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah that, that is yeah. true. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If only. Yeah. Never mind. One do, day. Do yeah. you still want that Ford Mustang? <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> I, I still think that, that's an appropriate thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So moving on to the next story, uh, Nev, and this one's for you. Yeah, this is in the Mail Online. Of course, we're just talking about uh, um, flights with fewer engines. This is a flight with lots of engines, and of course, because it's on the Mail Online, there's lots of uppercase text lots well. of shouting <laughs> lots of shouting yes. Yes, it says that the world's largest plane with a wingspan longer than a football field oh. fires up its six engines Ooh. for the first time ahead of 2019 test flight and this is named strato launch the colossal aircraft successfully fired all of its six pratt and whitney turbofan engines each weighing 8940 pounds or four uh, four tons for the first time this week the plane is the vision of Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen, who wants it to act as a giant air pad in the sky, allowing payloads to reach space faster and at a lower cost than existing technologies. The aircraft is so huge, if it sat in the centre of a football field, it would be wide enough for its wings to reach 12.5 sorry, 12 and a half feet or 3.8 metres beyond each goalpost. Instead of a satellite, the Strato launch airplane could launch a dream chaser spaceship. This could act in a mini shuttle to reach low Earth orbit destinations and return astronauts or payloads to a runway within 24 hours. Test flights were expected for 2016 and 2017, but project delays have pushed back the date to sometime in 2019. And it says that the Strato launch team completed fuel testing of all six fuel tanks to ensure their proper operation at the company's uh, facility in the Mojave Air and Spaceport in California. Each of the six tanks were filled independently to check their fill mechanisms were working correctly, and to uh, and to that they were that that they were properly sealed. In addition to fuel testing, engineers began testing the flight control system. So far, they have exercised uh, the fuel limits of motion and rate of deflection of the wings, control surfaces, and stabilizers. Building up to this week's engine tests, electrical, pneumatic, and fire detection systems were also given a once-over. Writing on the Strato launch website, CEO uh, 
Jean Floyd, or was that Jean Floyd, if he's uh, French? <laughs> um, engine testing was conducted with a build-up approach and consisted of three phases. First as a dry motor, where we used an auxiliary power unit to charge the engine. Next as a wet motor, where we introduced fuel. And finally, each engine was started one at a time and allowed to idle. In these initial tests, each of the six engines operated as expected. Over the next few months, they plan to continue to test the aircraft engines at higher power levels and varying configuration configurations culminating in the start of taxi tests on the runway and Paul Allen unveiled the world's largest aircraft at the start of June and uh, this is a bit of a monster really isn't it but it's it just piece, it it? concerns Huge. me slightly that anything involved Microsoft um, <laughs> well can't imagine know. why <laughs> blue screen of <laughs> death yeah 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 don't talk to me about blue screen of death I've had enough yeah. of those for today thank you no, what, what, Liz Piper. that's all I'm saying yeah. oh. <laughs> what, what do you think of this one guys come on Matt and Andy this is why, uh, why has it got two cockpits which one do the pilots sit in <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point yeah, yeah. Well, one in each perhaps you sit oh, one in each one of them looks like it's painted on Oh, perhaps, the it's one. Just, it's, perhaps it's just yeah. like for show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it is. The, the bottom one looks like it's for sure, and the one on the right looks like it's a real thing. I also don't get why they've used such a, talking about new technology and that. Why they've used four Pratt and Whitney, four thousand. Uh, sorry, six of them from a seven four seven. Why didn't they use something new? Yeah, yeah, yeah very true. true. Very true. Good point. Yeah, absolutely. Is is it because possibly playing devil devil's advocate here is because it's a a tried and tested engine? Maybe perhaps it's one possibly, that, yeah. that they're yeah, happy be. with. There's no point in redeveloping the wheel. He says. Or, or if, <laughs> if, if actually, if they, no if one else wants them. Exactly. Well, they, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, oh, we've got Nick, a prodigy of Nick here. I think. Yeah. But <laughs> I think if I think if Captain Nick was on there, he'd he'd be saying something along the lines of now. Well, there's plenty of them in the desert to use. For <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. So I've got uh, that in there, Nick. If you're listening, yeah. Nick. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. I've, I've helped he'll you. Be, there. He'll be very proud of you. I'm quite yeah. sure. But uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I was running the the sort of like the the simulation video, if you like, uh, whilst Nev was talking there. But actually, uh, the picture, the, the the real life picture here is it's it's, it's a frightening thing, isn't I'll it? I tell you I mean, what. If you're a passenger a on there, I mean, what what if the toilets are in that side uh, right. and not the other side? I mean, they may put. Two lots of toilets. <laughs> yeah. I think you're. Uh, I think you're through right. the wing. Yeah, absolutely. Put, I think it'll put, put the whole idea of wing walking to a whole new uh, level. Oh dear mm. lord! Right. Okay. Okay. Flight okay. level, I think. Yeah, I um, think we should move on. <laughs> uh. So the next story. Uh, this uh, this story is on the IndianExpress.com. Oh, Some blimey. interesting pictures of this one actually. Yeah, is, oh, um, all right. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Hint. Taken. And the uh, <laughs> yes, Matt. And the head. The headline. After nearly 24 hours, Spicejet aircraft that overshot runway towed away. Is that a joke name? By Spice? No, I mean, it's a real. It's just a real. Uh, I can't help airline. but find it slightly ironic no. that, uh, that an Indian um, called Spicejet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it is, really. <laughs> I just cut it anyway. Yeah. So the Spicejet <laughs> aircraft, uh, Sierra Golf 703. I personally love an Indian. Uh, <laughs> I do as well. <laughs> Varansi to Mumbai was carrying 183 passengers who were deplaned safely. So uh, almost uh, it's over 24 hours. Uh, since the aircraft overshot the main runway and skidded off into or onto a unpaid service, a surface, sorry, on Tuesday night, and um, it was uh, eventually towed away on Wednesday. So a team of 89 workers, skilled in emergency operations, worked amid continuous rain to lift the wheels of the aircraft stuck in the mud off the runway. Uh, the Spice Jet aircraft, Sierra Golf 703, um, the Varanasi to Mumbai, was carrying 183 passengers who were deplaned. Safely, officials at the airport said that a non-stop rain and the pressure to manage operations had delayed the removal of the aircraft from the runway. As many as 89 people worked together to remove the aircraft, weighing 85 tonnes. However, continuous rain made the task difficult, an ATC official said. On Wednesday, before the craft was removed, it had been decided that the main runway could not be operational until 6am on Thursday. It was not known till late if the main runway had become operational. This is one of the biggest disruptions of the uh, main runway at the Chaturpati Shivaji. Again, again another Indian Airport. dish. It sounds delicious. Uh, uh, since... It's a great score in Scrabble there. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, this is the biggest incident to uh, to disrupt the air, uh, airport since September 20, uh, 2005 uh, mm. when a Turkish Airlines plane skidded off due to excessive rainfall. Uh, the Airbus A340 aircraft had been removed after three days. So there's got a bit of an issue here with runway surface being wet, I think. Yeah. Um, so... Um, um, 
uh, the percolation of water at specific patches on the runway after heavy rain reflects neglect and the preventative measures taken. A major mishap was averted and corrective action needs to be taken, another uh, safety uh, expert has added. So an inquiry has been initiated by the Aircraft Accident Investigation Bureau, the AAIB, to look into the incident. Uh, our officer has started preliminary investigations. Uh, no reason can be gauged before the inquiry is over, uh, B.S. Ray, Deputy Director of the AAIB, said. Uh, Mumbai Airport uses a primary and main runway and a secondary runway for uh, flight operations, while operations at the main runway can go up to 45 to 48 flights in an hour. The secondary runway can handle 38 flights at a given time. Through thir uh, though 35 flights operate per hour out of secondary one way, we operate a maximum of 38 flights from here on Wednesday. So it's safe to say this uh, incident proved to be quite a, uh, a pain for the airport and put okay. the, uh, the runway out of action. It'd mm. uh, be interesting to know what other contributing factors um, you know, he didn't help for this plane. Obviously, mm. they couldn't stop at the end of the runway, and um, okay. yeah, it's, it's made quite a mess of the, the uh, aircraft. Yeah, so I think, I think this is going to need a, a bit of a jet wash. It's, it's, it's dug its own path. I think that's the best yeah. way to describe yeah. it. It's uh, made a bit of a mess there. Yes, it's. Uh, I mean, airliners land in heavy rain and stuff all the time, and it, yeah. it usually does boil down in a lot of cases of these to to the runway surface. Yeah. Having, not having enough drainage uh, has been yeah. an issue in the past with some okay. uh, runways. But uh, what, Matt and Andy, you're obviously pilots here. Come on, any uh, any ideas what possibly could have gone wrong here? Well, gone by what's written in that article, 83 tonnes is about 12 tonnes above max landing weight for starters for one of those. <laughs> that's probably a bit of um, Wikipedia, places, yeah, a bit yeah. of Wikipedia journalism there probably. <laughs> oh, yeah. they landed oh, at how HT outrageous. Tons. I'm sure you've, you've heard <laughs> of the old adage of all of us and the Swiss cheese have got to line up. So I'm sure oh, yeah. many... Many things that caused this. So as I don't really know what happened, and as a pilot, I wouldn't like to properly speculate. Uh, no, of course not. No, no absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, but, but, I mean, you could you could maybe becoming... offer a light insight, perhaps, in <laughs> a, a, a slight it insight as to, to what kind of alter or uh, alternative preparations you make for landing on an incredibly wet runway. Well, we have performance calculations yeah. for certain conditions, so you can put standing water, certainly on the Airbus. We have electronic flight bags, so we can just put the performance in, mm. um, and it will calculate that, and you can put the depth of the water in. Um, but obviously, I don't know what their situation was. Of course, if you listen to our episode on <laughs> aquaplaning, ah, yeah. oh, hey. nice plug, in there. very yeah. good plug. Shameless I like plug. it very well. A a applause, I think. There, nice, <laughs> nicely shoehorned in. Excellent. Well, Which is generic that episode, so you don't have to be an Airbus pilot. For that Splendid, one. good, excellent. excellent. What, what about someone with zero pilot skills whatsoever? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. AKA yeah, me. It basically yeah. tells you what to do should you experience aquaplaning. Splendid. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Right. There we go. Okay. What about in my coach? Well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the principles would work on there. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, I like that it. Is. I like this. Yeah. Yes, this is this is. Good. You'll have to look through the pack, the pretty uh, back episodes, Matt. I will. No, I will. Yeah. I will. Okay. I will. I tell I'll you, send you the link. Yeah, I'll, well, you. <laughs> I'll, I'll squeeze it into the other things I don't have time yeah, for. It'll be great. Yeah, yeah, yes. It'll be fine. Have you any idea how much preparation goes I into these to little clips each week? You, I know, but you. You do nothing all day. Uh, <coughs> <laughs> you just anyway. drive around a forklift all day. Why did oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Anyway. So, so moving on to the next okay. story. Yeah, that'll be me next, won't it? Yes, mm. this is uh, on Flight Global, a great source, as you know, for... Awesome source. Um, yeah, absolutely. And the headline on this particular story is Temperature, be temperature Error Behind Sunwing 737's Near Overrun. Uh, so preliminary analysis indicates that a temperature data entry error introduced during takeoff calculations resulted in a Sunwing Airlines Boeing 737-800 almost failing to become airborne during departure from Belfast. The airline's thrust setting was grossly low, says the UK Air Accidents Investigation Branch, and it barely managed to lift off from runway 07. It was uh, low enough to strike an approach light just 35 centimetres tall, uh, located 29 metres beyond the end of the runway, some 1,500 metres past the runway end. Uh, the aircraft was still only 220 feet above um, the airport's elevation. Now, this is one thing that really annoys me when we have stories like this, and I apologise. Stories. Stories. Uh, <laughs> stories like this. Is that throughout the entire story, they have been using metric measurements, and then you get to the last line where it mo moves from metres to feet. 
that just really annoys me. Anyway, uh, it's um, it, it, is there some reason for that? Have I missed some? Anyway, uh, uh, well, in aviation, we would use we use um, meters for runway length and we okay. use heights for feet. So that's probably there we right. Go. Okay, there we oh, go. fair enough. All right. Yeah, no, I'll I'll take that. I'll shut <laughs> up. Uh, <laughs> amen to that. Investigators uh, investigators determined that the thrust setting delivered an engine speed of just eighty one point five percent of N one, uh, which the inquiry says was significantly below the correct level of 93.3. Examination of the crew's electronic flight bag calculations showed they had been performed correctly before entry into the flight management computer, but simulation of the entry procedure showed that, er, showed that erroneously entering uh, top of climb air temperature rather than the airport temperature uh, into a specific field on the computer would have generated the low thrust setting. The inquiry says uh, this is only credible. Uh, this is the only credible path which could have created the situation. The aircraft involved in the incident, uh, Charlie Foxtrot Whiskey Golf Hotel, was equipped with an earlier version of flight management computer software, which did not feature a cross check between the temperature entered by the crew and that detected by the aircraft's probes. Uh, investigators uh, believe the aircraft reached its V1 decision speed um, of 144 knots with around 900 metres of the runway remaining. The crew had realised the aircraft was not accelerating normally. Crucially, an analysis of takeoff performance found that, the, that had the aircraft suffered an engine failure at V1, it might not have had sufficient performance to climb safely away, although it would have su had sufficient room to stop if the crew had aborted takeoff. The inquiry also found that the crew did not advance the thrust levers above 81.5 N1 setting until it had reached a height of 800 feet. Investigators, investigators have recommended that US regulators mandate implementation of an updated flight management software including the cross-check. None of the occupants comprising of 179 passengers and six crew were injured during the incident which occurred on the 21st of July as the aircraft departed for Corfu. Now, Nev, I think you've... Um, yeah, Nev's got a bit of... Yeah, uh, you've got something that, that uh, you've been looking up yeah, on this particular I had story. a look at the yeah. AAIB um, investigation and they've done one of their special bulletins and special normally means naughty oh. or, inter <laughs> or okay. interim yeah. or yes. something like okay. that. And they're always right. very careful not, not to blame the crew or they try and do that. But th something doesn't quite ring true with me here because obviously um, in most takeoffs you're not using uh, max takeoff thrust. You, you don't need it. There's enough runway, or yeah. the temperature is fine, and you, you don't need. You haven't got enough. You, you're not particularly heavy. But this 737 uh, had 179 people on board with bags and maybe some cargo as well. And they're going to Corfu from Belfast International, which is probably a four-hour flight, roughly something like that. So they're going to be fairly heavy and. Um, I understand that obviously they're, they're doing an assumed uh, temperature takeoff here, so they're putting all the uh, data into the uh, electronic flight bag, as it mentioned. But it's all very well putting all this data in, but sometimes you've just got to have a look at it uh, and go, does that look right? Mm. And I think that's uh, one of the things that was missing here, um, because you can put all the data in you like, and I think the, the Airbus, Airbus terminology is, is flex for this, which is again is a, an assumed temperature so that the uh, aircraft's engines aren't producing full thrust. Mm. But uh, coming back to a level of 81.5% uh, of N1 uh, with a heavy aircraft, and I forget what Belfast International's uh, runway is, it's about 9,500 feet, I think. Um, but um, that just doesn't feel quite right. And I don't know what you guys think, uh, you uh, A320 chaps, but... Uh, I reckon you would probably flex off that runway, but yeah. what doesn't ring true to us is that they put the cruise Top temperature plane, in. Yeah. yeah, I don't yeah. think that that's probably some journal journalism where they've... Yeah. Sort of are you suggesting there may be some... Between the lines there may be some inaccuracies in the story. nowhere near anything else. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it, it is a sort of strange story. And presumably, I mean, they were saying that they, they did confess that they were operating with outdated um, sort of um, software, weren't they, on, on the actual flight bag uh, side of things. So I presume this is a fault that's been corrected in a later version then, judging by... by I think um, it's the, the actual FMS software that uh, is outdated because that doesn't... Because uh, on the newer ones, it, the, it looks at the actual outside temperature and says, are you sure about that? Right. But, uh, yeah... 
cross checking is a big thing in the industry at the minute now because there's there's a lot of incidents like this that have been occurring now and yeah. I think uh, who are, well uh, some when they operate for uh, Thompson don't they so they've, they've probably um changed their processes now after yeah. that yeah I mean yeah. Airbus themselves have actually led a lot of changes that has had to be fed down into the airlines with cross checking so you know even the manufacturers are are really forcing the airlines to do this and change their procedures mm. And just was... for the chat, Andy's the one with the beard. Right. Everyone's asking which is which. <laughs> okay, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> yes. And do you jog around East Midlands Airport? No, because you're the pilot without the beard. <laughs> yeah. Oh, me? No, I don't. Definitely don't. No. Do, do we look like we jog? No chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've got a phrase that I use that is like, I'm built for comfort, not speed. Uh, that's that's, that's where I go with you. There's a reason we chose a job where we're forced to sit down and fed. <laughs> Fair point. Yes, <laughs> I like it. Yes, that, that's a joke of genius. It's nice. Oh. nice to know the chat room are up to their I usual know. standard of highbrow questioning. Yes. And also a great bit of investigating there by yeah. you, Nev. Well done. <laughs> Very good. Yes, absolutely. So th this was a, a bit of a close shave, uh, gents, wasn't it? Mm. Uh, was um, I you know there, so, there, was, yeah. there was no options left there uh, so uh, yeah so yeah, bit, uh, and uh, presumably the naughty boy briefing as as I like to refer to it has perhaps indicated um, you know ways of ensuring it, such things don't happen again of course I mean it's um, as, as uh, both Andy and Matt just said it, it, you know that's the whole purpose of cross checking, of cross -checking to make sure yeah, that, that the figures are uh, what they really should be for for the runway conditions and so, temperature and weights and everything something basically didn't really go according to you know yeah. something wasn't done perhaps during pre-flight checks, he says, yeah. choosing his words in carefully. Uh, okay, so uh, I think we should move on before any of us get sued. Well, the, ne and the next story is <laughs> next story is, is quite appropriate for uh, the the um, well the, the Berlin meetup actually okay, that's going right. on oh, yes. at the moment. Yes, yeah, so okay. Nev. Nev, what's yeah, this one all about? Uh, on the Fox News web website. Uh, well, that must a, be true then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Fake news, fake news, fake news. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it says that Jet 2 passenger spots beer in cockpit after landing at British Airport. <gasps> and um, Ooh, there's a rather Steve Lewis photo, of yeah. North Hampshire said that he was shocked upon landing at Birmingham Airport and seeing a can of Stella Artois <laughs> sitting between the pilots. Poor choice. Uh, the plane that had <laughs> landed and the seatbelt light came on. I stood up to get my suitcase and... And as I did, the cockpit door opened and I noticed the can, said Lewis, according to the Metro. I turned to my partner, Stephen, who didn't believe me at first, but then he noticed you could clearly see the Stella branding. I was so shocked, I couldn't understand why there was alcohol in the cockpit, added Lewis, who also snapped a photo of the beer. He reportedly complained to the airline about it too, but was initially told that his photo couldn't have been taken aboard his flight. This is what upset me the most, I explained to her, that I could prove that it was taken on the Alicante to Birmingham flight. And she replied, saying that the can had been given to the pilot for safekeeping, said Lewis. <laughs> and uh, wow. Jet 2 has since released a statement in response to Lewis's <laughs> photograph, though they claimed the beer had simply been handed off to the cabin crew by a passenger upon landing. Upon further investigation of the photograph, we can confirm that it is an unopened can which had been handed to a member of our cabin crew by a customer when they were leaving the aircraft, said Jet 2 in a statement obtained by the metro this unopened can was then put down in the cockpit by a member of cabin crew so that she could continue helping customers as they disembarked lewis meanwhile isn't entirely satisfied with jet 2's explanation it even had a napkin underneath which it, which is how they serve drinks to passenger so i'm a bit <laughs> skeptical as to whether there was whether it was there because someone had left it said lewis who is now seeking an admission of wrongdoing from the airline. It concerns me that alcohol is even allowed in the cockpit, uh, whether it was open or not. And um, <laughs> just a I think non story. It's, it's so yeah. funny. It just amused me, yeah. though. Come yeah. on, come on, Matt and Andy, give us your, give us your, uh, your input into this. Well, my biggest concern is if he's that concerned that we can't be trusted to have any alcohol on board the flight deck without drinking it. <laughs> well, there we go. Neville did. Yeah, well, good point. Yes, yeah, I think that's. I think that's fair. I did. I think we. I think we have to ask how many stories have we run in the last six eight months that involve jet two and alcohol. Yeah, not normally for in but the flight. It's normally, deck, it's, it's, it's normally, normally in the cabin. You know, it's usually World War Three breaking out behind them. <laughs> yeah. To be fair, but uh, yeah, it's a bit of a, it's a bit oh, as you say. I think as Nev dear. says, it's perhaps a little bit of a non-story because uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure. I mean, it's on the, it's on the ground, isn't it? I mean, I know our airline we have a policy that there's no alcohol containers even allowed yeah. in. So even if you bought some duty free, you wouldn't be allowed it yeah. in the flight deck. But 
And there, and there um, is clearly, um, if you look at that photograph, there is clearly cabin crew there, unless um, the pilots are wearing, you know, very appropriate. In fact, yeah. <laughs> it looks like the cabin crew is sat in the jump seat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's yeah. in there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. See, yeah, absolutely. It, it, I, I agree. So uh, I, I, I don't know. It's perhaps a, perhaps it was her birthday. It, perhaps it was her birthday, and yeah. she was celebrating with a can of Stella Artois. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> other so, other far better beers are available. Anyway, so moving on, the last story is uh, on Flight Global, and uh, this uh, last story. Then this headline is: Probe opens into Emirates A380 descent below glide slope. So United Arab Emirates investigators are probing a serious incident during which an Emirates Airbus A380 descended below the glide slope during an approach into Moscow's Domodai. D- d- I beg your pardon? Begins with D and ends with O. Domaday da 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 Okay, moving on. Yeah. Uh, the General <laughs> Civil Aviation Authority's Accident Investigation Division tells Flight Global that the incident occurred on the 10th of September. It says the aircraft had been transporting 446 occupants, comprising of 420 passengers and 26 crew, when the incident occurred on the approach to runway 14 right. No injuries or damage to the aircraft were reported, says the authority. Russia's counterpart, the Interstate Aviation Committee, has yet to comment on the situation. Under aviation regulations, it would be the lead investigation agency for the event. Neither authority has indicated the extent of the deviation, nor has the type of approach been disclosed, although the runway is equipped with ILS. Emirates uh, operates twice daily to uh, this particular airport, with the latter fly EK131 operated by an A380. The approach was conducted around sunset. Meteorological data for the airport indicates clear weather and good visibility at the time. So come on then, guys. What is a descent below glide slope for our listeners? Hi, everyone. Go on. <clears throat> okay. Um, so... If you're not aware of the glide slope, that's the beam that's sent up from the runway to give us a, a projection to come down. So that's the angle that we come okay, in to cool. land yeah, at. Yeah. And you're protected when you're on the what we call the glide slope. If you then go below that glide slope, then obviously you're closer to the ground than you should to be. So on this, they've obviously, according to this, gone, gone below that. But there isn't actually very much detail on here. So unless mm. any more information comes out, it's pretty hard to comment on it, really, to be honest. Not enough, you not enough data, really. Yeah, I mean, it says that it's gone below the glide slope, but no indication of deviation, nor has the type of approach been disclosed. I mean, it does all seems a bit... It's a bit vague, perhaps, not, yeah. Not to, yeah, yeah, not, not yeah. to get us towards Sioux territory, but uh, yeah, it all seems very, very vague. Hmm. Yeah, agreed. And but, but perhaps it's because there is an investigation still ongoing yeah. into it, perhaps as to why yeah. not all of the details haven't been have, have not been. Have any of you guys flown into uh, Domo de Devo Airport? <laughs> um, I haven't personally. No, no, me neither. No, no. But I know it's um, they use meters instead of feet there, so you have to use a table to convert oh, wow. um, oh. all the all the altitudes there. You have to okay. convert them all because. Or the autopilot system on the airbuses use feet. I right. think the 380 has a, an option where you, that can be purchased Switch. with it, which I guess okay. Emirates will have. I it. assume so. That yeah. can, you can just press a button and voila, as modern aviation is now, it's all there for you. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's got to be the way forward. It's just, it saves somebody breaking out the converged, conversion table anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So then that brings uh, the commercial news segment to a close. And uh, we have got coming up for you next, uh, well, it's, uh, it's the passenger experience it segment. It is indeed, from yes. Nev. So, so uh, after ooh. that, we're going to have a chat uh, with uh, Matt and Andy. Um, but Nev, if you want to introduce your amazing segment, uh, far away. Thank you very much indeed, Carlos. Yeah, well, I'm talking with Liz Piper again. Um, this is the flight she took between um, Heathrow and Toronto, going back home after she'd, she'd been over in the UK for a week or so. And um, quite interesting about some of the service levels she experienced there. And um, I did a Skype call with her. And uh, so off we go. Let's have a listen. Hello again, it's Nev here with Nev's Passenger Experience. Uh, I'm in the studio this week, but uh, I'm talking to a lady who we've spoken to before. Uh, she's some three and a half thousand miles away over in Toronto, and it's Liz Piper. Hello, Liz. Hi, Nev. Great to talk to you again. Yeah, thanks very much indeed for uh, chatting. Well, we're going to talk about your journey back from Heathrow to Toronto because you managed to get yourself an upgrade, although you did have to pay for it because it's on the on the bidding system with Air Canada, isn't it? T- tell me, just remind me how that works. 
Thanks, Nev. Yeah, yeah, it, it was a new experience for me, that's for sure. And I think it's a relatively new um, facility that Air Canada is offering, although I know a lot of other airlines have it. So about three weeks before I left Toronto, I got an email from Air Canada asking me if I'd like to upgrade, and I chose to. And you put in a bid, as you said, um, and they give you an indication of whether it's low, all right, or I did put in a high one, so I don't know, but I assume they would say that. Um, so anyway, then it just sits there, and a, a couple of days before you, I, I asked for the upgrade on the way home, and so a couple of days before I flew home from Heathrow, I got an email from Air Canada saying, um, you've been upgraded. So uh, I was pretty happy, and um, it was, I have flown business before, not for quite a long time, and I, I was really quite interested to have the experience again. So, and it's always sort of a nice treat. Mm, certainly, right. So tell us all about it. Tell us all about the, the check-in, and was there any sort of fast track stuff on, on the way through to the, uh, the check-in? Well, absolutely. I just want to back up a minute and say, first of all, thank you for making the first part of the trip so great, because not only did Nev drive me right to Heathrow, he insisted on parking the car and walking me into the terminal, which was really great of you, Nev. Thank you very much. Right. Standard service, ma'am. Standard service. Um, anyway, so, yeah, and you were able to actually find where the priority check-in was for Air Canada, and absolutely no line there. I just strolled up to the lady and... It was fast. It was uh, absolutely no hassle at all. And then you walk me over to uh, what, yes, I believe is termed the fast track security line at Heathrow, which I think, Nev, correct me if I'm wrong, is only open for first and business class yeah, passengers. That's right. Yeah. So that's where we said our goodbyes. And I did glance over and look at the regular line and it was pretty long. But mm. in the fast track, it was, again, incredibly easy, a very nice facility. I don't think we have anything like that here. Um, so I would say there were only maybe 10 passengers going through it at the time I was there. So uh, very quick through there, no hassles, no issues. And then uh, as you know, because you're the king of the lounges, uh, one of the features that you get access to is a lounge. And Air Canada has what they call their Maple Leaf Lounge at Heathrow. So I made my way there, which is a, a bit of a trek from the, the place that you come through security. You go down a long escalator, and I guess you go under some runways and stuff because yeah. you're going quite a long way. But you get over to the area where the gates are, and uh, I found the lounge, no problem. And it's, it's really, I thought, very nicely done. Lots of blonde maple wood and sort of Canadian quote unquote touches. Very mm. nice. I was there around nine o'clock in the morning. So the offering was breakfast and it was a buffet, but there was someone there if you wanted them to make you an omelet or whatever. So lots of lovely cushy leather chairs with lots of plugs for your electronics. So I got a nice breakfast and just sat and did lots of plane watching, which was lovely. Um, and then uh, the plane was due to depart at noon. So I would say around 11-ish, I just wandered down toward the gate, which was pretty close by to the lounge. Yeah. And again, a nice uh, boarding experience there because, you know, you do get a, a priority boarding. And um, it's so funny, when I got on, I thought to myself, Nev, I probably could have bid a bit lower because there were quite a few empty business class seats. But <laughs> anyway, you get on board, um, as I think is probably standard procedure, even before they've closed the doors, they're offering you a tray of uh, fizzy wine or orange juice or fizzy water. Yeah. And I had some water, I think, at that point. And then they do give you right away a very nice menu with several options for food on it. And it says right at the top of the menu that they're actually going to do the meal service fairly quickly after takeoff, but you can request a later meal, which really appealed to me, seeing as I had just tucked into a fairly nice breakfast. Mm, yeah. So I did ask for a later one. So I had a couple of glasses of wine and some nice nuts and listened to a couple of APGs on the way home. And... Um, all in all, it was really nice. The food I thought was good. I thought it probably did suffer a bit from me waiting several hours for them to serve it. 
Um, probably it was would have been a more optimal food experience if I'd had it right away. But it was it was perfectly fine. I have mm. no complaints. And how did it compare to the flight uh, from Toronto to Heathrow? Because you was it premium economy or was it economy you flew? No, I flew economy with a bulkhead seat, so yeah. I was the row right behind premium economy. It, I mean. I had lots of route. Okay, so flying over to Heathrow was a Dreamliner, and flying home was a Triple Seven. Mm. I would say, um, I mean, obviously it was a different cabin experience because I was in business as opposed to economy. But I would definitely say I noticed the quiet on the Dreamliner was was quite mar- remarkable. I thought that the Triple Seven was definitely noisier. Mm. We had on-time departures and on-time arrivals, which is always pleasant to experience, and uh, it, it was. It, I, would, I was pl- pleasantly surprised, honestly, Nev, because Air Canada gets a lot of bashing here because it's sort of the national airline, and everybody loves to loves to hate Air Canada. But I, I was pretty impressed, actually. Excellent. And what, what was the food like on in the business class cabin? Uh, as I said, the three options for the main meal. Um, I think there was a vegetarian option of some kind. A lamb option, which usually I would have taken because I'm a fan of lamb, but I actually took the fish. And I remember Jen saying, never take the fish, but <laughs> I actually I actually did have the fish, and it was really good. Great. But it was quite cute. When they were actually doing the earlier meal service, this young male flight attendant who was serving in the cabin came by, and he said, you're having your meal later. Is that right? And I said, yes. And he said, you know what? I'm going to bring you some ice cream anyway, because he said, we have ice cream. And he said, in a few hours, it'll probably just be a big puddle. So he said, would you like some ice cream now? <laughs> so yeah, I took the ice cream, I have to admit. That's a nice touch, isn't it? That's great. And what about the other end, getting off at Pearson? Is there any priority uh, baggage handling, or, or do you have to mix it with the, the great unwashed uh, in the well, arrivals hall? Yeah, I, we have to obviously clear customs when we come back in. There's absolutely no priority through our customs or immigration. It, it, but it, but it's very automated at Pearson now. Mm. Um, you actually do it through a kiosk, and then you just hand a little slip to an, an officer. So that was very fast. And yes, we do get priority baggage in the in sense of by the time I got to the carousel, my bag was already there. Yeah. So. Um, you know, I guess they're first off. I guess they arrange the bag so that they're first off. So I would say from the time we pulled up to the gate to the time I actually got out and got into a car to go home was 20 minutes maybe, which oh, is pretty good. Yeah, that's very good, isn't it? That's excellent. And uh, what what about um, the next time you come over? Because you've, you've now done the business class thing. Um, it's probably very tempting to, to do that again, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, you you just hit the nail on the head there, Deb, because I kind of think, oh, my God, now I'm super spoiled because I did enjoy the whole experience, the lounge experience, the the whole um, cabin experience and and um, the service was lovely. So I would probably bid on it again. Um, you know, you have to just I, I think in everything like this, you have to have a number in your head that you're willing to pay and, and not go over that and say, the experience is worth this to me. And ha- having had a positive experience, I-, I would definitely bid on it again and see where it goes. So yeah, I-, I, would, I, would, I would love to do it again. Well, that's really interesting, Liz. And thanks ever so much indeed for talking to us once again about your passenger experience. Thanks, Nev. My pleasure. And as <sighs> always, Nev, an absolutely fantastic uh, segment. I, I, I love Liz, Liz to bits, I really do, because she was, she was so <coughs> great in Pittsburgh. Bless her, she spent the entire time driving us all round, didn't she? Bless her, she was our, yeah, our she was taxi very, very, much, very much so. Much, yeah. I must say, yeah. I, don't know, I don't know a lot about this um, uh, thing that, that, that she was talking about, where uh, this bidding for um, um, like first-class seats. So presumably uh, the bidding takes place if all the first-class first seats haven't gone, essentially. Yeah, what what happens is, and I've just noticed this because I'm going to go to I'm going to Brazil uh, for work in October, and I'm flying uh, TAP via Lisbon. Yeah. And the, I've noticed the same thing on on the check in there. Obviously, my my boss has booked me the cheapest flight possible, um, which uh, I will have to try and find a way of upgrading myself. There's a little slider control, right? Um, and there's a little um, level meter that goes with it as well as you move it along to say whether that's a, a good bid, a reasonable. Oh. Bid. Okay, or, right. or bid. and y- you won't really know until very close to the flight whether your bid has been How successful close you're being, or not. yeah okay it's i suppose yeah 
it's uh, i guess it is cheaper than just buying a ticket outright i assume i mean it almost certainly will be but it's all about the load factor as well and, and whether yeah, you're, you're chosen for the upgrade but of course i say the upgrade you will be paying for it of course yeah. well that is true so uh, now listen guys we're going to uh move on to another segment just before the show started we were um having a little chat with a certain meetup that uh, is taking place so i'll leave it to carlos to introduce so with a change to the usual program, we've had a very special call in via Skype all the way from Berlin. And uh, it's a bit of an APG meet up. There's everyone there and uh, everyone and his, and, his, and his parent, really, I think, you know, and his cat. So uh, we're going to go straight over to Berlin to Dr. Steph, who's in charge of the meet up. I don't know that I would say that I'm in charge, but hello, Carlos, hello, Matt, and hello, Ness. Hey. And yeah, as you said, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong direction on the iPad here. I'll try and look into the camera. Um, we're here in Berlin, Germany, where um, private pilot Tillman was kind enough to uh, host a meetup for us here tonight at the wonderful, wonderful Circus Master Brewery. Uh, we've actually got quite a good group here already. Uh, we've been here for not quite an hour so far. So I think what we'll do is we'll just walk around and everyone um, kind, of kind of introduce themselves and say hello. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah, okay. So we're introducing to a few people. Who have we got uh, sat around the table at the moment? Sorry. All right, so we go around the table and... Uh... We're going to do introductions for our plane talk. Hey, Hi, I'm Brian. I'm a private pilot from the U.S. Open in Berlin. I know. Fantastic. Thank you. Hi, Brian. Keep going. Hello, guys. I'm Henry. I'm from Berlin. Nice to see you guys. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to see you maybe in the U.S. or in the U.K. sometime in the future. And uh, yeah, good to see you. Fantastic. Hey. Excellent. Okay, this is going very well, isn't it? All right, we've got a whole uh, table full of business. Uh, misfits. <laughs> <laughs> misfits, how rude. Okay, next person we have on the table. Let's do an introduction to a friend talking UK, so if everyone wants to. Oh, I, I don't know this guy, I've never met him before. But never, <laughs> never ever seen him before in my uh, life. This is my dad. Oh, hey! Yeah, so, yeah, for, the mar- for the marathon, so no. we uh, invited him along to the meeting. Hi guys, I listen to you a lot. Hey! Wow, well, that's, that's, that's an honor indeed, honor. sir. What an honor, honor. thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. So, who else we got here? Hello. Hi. How are you doing? Uh, so, I just say your name. Where are you from? Sorry, I'm Steve. I'm from Ireland. Oh, wow. Hey. <laughs> hey. <laughs> this is what we like to hear. Hey, just across the water, neighbors. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and ah, and obviously we recognise these two lovely Masha. people. It's the lovely Fabian. Masha and the lovely Fabian. Hello, guys. You're right. How are you doing? <laughs> That's what like we like to see. Him, Absolutely, right? yeah, yeah. And then moving along. Wow, have you come all the way? Have you come all the way from New Zealand for this? Did you come all the way from New Zealand for this? Yes, all the way, man. Fantastic. Oh, cool. All right, so fantastic. We've got two more people to introduce. So we got two more people to introduce. And so I'll do the introductions for Jessica here. She's like, yay, thank you. I'm Dr. Stephanie's super fan from Great School. <laughs> <laughs> She's one of my oldest friends. And oh, wow. She's actually running the marathon. Oh, my Sunday. goodness. So, Whoa, again, fantastic! Hey. Look at that. I'm Another impressed. Crazy person. Uh, and of course, and, uh, love and love this love is love. our marvelous host, Brew of course, Master. the Brewmaster General himself. This is this is uh, the Brewmaster. 
<laughs> you you are the <laughs> brew master. Much <laughs> Although I, I, I just like beer. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm and I'm really grateful for commercial pilots because they enable me to have both at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. No, brilliant. They say there's two things you never want to see how they are made. Right. Sausages and airplanes. Okay. That's not true for beer. Come with Quite me. Quite right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay. It's very light in here now. Yeah. This is where the magic happens. Hello. Hey. Hi. You see a lot of stainless steel. You see Heiko and his associate here. What's your name? Andreas. Andreas. And um, they are working on a specialty from Scotland right now. Oh, wow. Which is uh, uh, the first time that we are trying this. And it's a uh, high It's a Scottish ale. Scottish ale. Scottish, Scottish ale that um, they've been brewing today. Wow. Um, it's brewing in this little brewery uh, behind us. And then it's fermenting in these tanks over here. So it takes about another, well, 10 days, maybe two weeks until the magic happens. That's the time it takes because everything that's good takes time. Quite right. And or, or how I learned um, the other day, nothing good in life ever happens fast, except if you're in a jet plane. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, so um, you have to come here in about two weeks' time and try the Scottish Trail. Splendid, right? I, I'll um, I'll I'll, uh, I'll book my plane ticket now. Then I think that's <laughs> all right. All right. If if if, if that site is good enough to get you on a plane, Matt. Wow. Yeah. Yay! All right. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'll give you that. Yeah. Bravo. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, mate, it looks amazing. Oh, I love. I love it. I love stainless steel and clean tiles. It's just. Oh, so excited. That Lovely, looks amazing. Man. So, um, uh, what uh, what other brew uh, beers do you brew there, Tillman? Um, we brew uh, different specialties. Um, okay. Right now, um, or the last one that we had on um, was an amber, and that was quite good. Amber. And what's on right mm. now is our specialty. So um, the pills that is on tap right now mm. is a specialty that we are calling the Doctor Staff Conversion Train. Oh wow! Because hey. what it does, is it will convert her from an IPA connoisseur right. to a pills lover. <laughs> Do you know I, I I admire your dedication to actually converting Dr. her Steph, away from a pills now. I could Dr. You know, Steph did message me. The territory we Germans are very proud of. Well, quite right, quite right. She absolutely. is on her way. <laughs> so. Oh, brilliant. So now, now listen, Dr. Steph, you're actually there for a specific reason, aren't you? Other than obviously meeting up with these people. So you're here to do a marathon. I am. And uh, so when is that? Is that tomorrow? The, the no, yes, I'm definitely here for the marathon. It's on Sunday. Um, oh. I think it starts around 10 a.m. local. Okay. And... That's tomorrow morning, right? <laughs> <laughs> I have to stop drinking. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. yeah that's... Can't be tomorrow morning. No, no. That's uh, why this worked out so beautifully. Sounds great. Sounds Sounds great. Good luck, Steph. So, so I suppose seeing seeing as the main man, the the, the, the legend that is Mr. Owen Shimizu is there as well. I suppose we ought to yes. say hello to him as well. So <laughs> there we go. Hello, Owen. How are you? Hey guys. Are you now? I, I assume copious amounts of alcohol are being consumed. You're having a nice time, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Don't drink, Doctor said. So, so what is that that you have in your tankard at the moment? What is the chosen now, beverage? This is a wonderful uh, yeah, specialty that um, that has Oh wow! On. Look at that. <laughs> that is fantastic. On tap today. That so is what I like. This is uh, special. Welcome to the Acme Airlines <laughs> World Lounge. Yes. And today's special on top is the Dr. Dr. Steph, Steph conversion, conversion train. train. Now, this is what oh, I like to... Oh, nice. This right. is what I like to hear. Now, now, obviously, we know that you're more of a sort of an IPA sort of person, aren't you? Under normal circumstances, Dr. Steph, you're an IPA fan usually, aren't you? Exactly. This so, is not actually an IPA. Um, and someone was explaining, you can probably do a better job than I can still, but basically, they did what they do best here. They, they pretty traditional German mills, uh, but they added some uh, to perfection with five ingredients, so special malts, aromatic hops, the finest yeast, fresh Berlin water, and love. 
So, ah, now the most Im- the most important ingredient there obviously is love. That's what we like to hear. So uh, I think it's safe to say that you're, you're well. As I say, from all of us here, uh, we're going to wrap up now, unfortunately. But uh, from all of us here at PT UK, I hope you're having a really, really nice time. Of course, thanks are. for taking a brief, yes, brief time out of your celebrations to dial into the show here. It's been great to uh, see you and chat to you. And good luck, Doctor Steph, with your marathon on Sunday. The very best of Yay. luck. Yay! Yeah. Take care. Yeah, take, care. take care, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.
listening to something unrelated and I thought I wish I could be absorbing information about the 320 and because I'm just wasting this time commuting in and I thought oh maybe I could do it myself and good friends with Andy I know he's got good technical knowledge as well so we went for a beer and approached him and said you fancy doing this podcast and sort of led from there didn't it yeah and I stupidly said yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah do you know I have a similar problem I stupidly sat in for the guy that used to do this and I haven't been able to escape ever since <laughs> anyway <clears throat> So you start, obviously, you guys started the A320 podcast, and uh, I mean, are you enjoying this whole podcast, um, producing producing, yeah. and, and the community and stuff? Yeah, it's good. The, it's done much better than we thought. It's been, we thought maybe, you know, a handful of people may tune in and listen, and part of it was that it would improve our own knowledge by mm. doing the podcast. But yeah. It's been way more popular than we thought it would ever be yeah so. we, we thought maybe 10 or 12 downloads a week or something like that and now last month it was over eleven and a half thousand yeah. per month wow yeah. that's incredible yeah 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 that's and we've had good. guys from uh examiners from delta get in touch with us and say that they're telling their guys in the states to listen to it and stuff like that and lots of uh trainers and stuff like that have been in touch to say they love it so it's really it's starting to sort of um get momentum now really yeah. which we never thought it would get one of my favorite things is um i flew with the first officer of the day who told me that i should listen to this a320 <laughs> podcast it's really good <laughs> <laughs> love Ouch. it so, yeah okay i'm Are glad we... that's what you said because yeah, well, it's been really embarrassing if <laughs> yeah, said it's yeah, if he'd said yeah whatever you do don't listen to that yeah that's so actually pretty... on that and that and not on that note do you do i mean do you find there's a lot of people that you fly with or people in in the airline that you fly for who do listen to you guys and, and kind of think well yeah yeah, are you? yeah a yeah. lot yeah yeah it's uh, it's it's really odd. You'll have people come up to you at work who you've never met before, mm. and they just hear your voice in the crew room and say, "Oh, are you Matt from the uh, from the podcast?" Yeah, and it's I had that happen on the bus, didn't I? I just yeah. had uh, another captain lean up and go, "Are you Andy?" I was like, <laughs> uh, "Yeah, why?" He's like, "Oh, I love your podcast." All oh, right, I thought I was in trouble or something. <laughs> yeah, <right? absolutely. laughs> yeah, I must. I, I had something very similar. We, we were very lucky. We were invited uh, to go and have a look around Heathrow's air traffic control tower. Yeah, and uh, I think one of the things, again, a similar thing to what you were saying there. We were actually in the air traffic control tower, and this guy who I had no idea just leant over the console uh, where where he was where he was at Heathrow and just, "Oh, hi, Matt. Great to see you. I, I love the love the show." And I'm like. Okay, <laughs> it's all these people that you don't know who are listening to it. You sort of get. It's just it, it is a bizarre thing, isn't it? But uh, I, again, what I, I love about um, yours, as I say, is as I was saying earlier, is the detail. I mean, it, it was that a conscious decision, as you like? Is like the, we call it the Haynes Manual of of of, of the Airbus world. You know, it's uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it is a revision tool for. I mean, anyone can enjoy it if you're interested yeah. in that sort of thing, but it, it is essentially designed for mm. A320 pilots who are studying for either their initial type rating or for their recurrent training. Mm. Yeah, when, when we do each podcast, especially uh, the really technical ones, when I'm writing them, or both writing them, we both sit there and think, what, as a pilot, do I want to know about this? Because the Airbus is exceptionally technical. Mm. Everything's intertwined together. You can lose one system and that wipes out the ILS and you wouldn't even realise that that's the case because of it. Yeah. So it is inherently a very technical podcast, but we try and just cut it down to 15, 20 minutes to mm -hmm. the, the absolute stuff that you need to know and try and get rid of a lot of the waffle. Because the other problem as well, with the FCOM, which is the Flight Crew Operating Manual, it is essentially terrible Franglish. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. okay, good. Yeah. It's like they've used... Uh, Google Translate. Yeah. Google Translate. Yeah. <laughs> Google Translate. Yeah. 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 And you've, got to, you've got to try and turn that round into something that's understandable and yeah. readable. Like the podcast we're putting out on Monday is about a ground speed mini, which is a little bit of a complicated system. There's one page on it in the book, and there's a lot more to it than that. Mm. So a lot of this is what I, I like about it, guys, because um, you're obviously doing your interpretation of the FCOM, uh, and, and that's great. And you managed to put it into bite-sized chunks, and, and just, as you say, having 15 or 20 minutes worth of uh, material is, is just the mm. right amount of time, I, I think, isn't it, for people to yeah, digest it? Yeah, I mean, before it. we started it, we sort of, without telling anyone what we were doing, we'd sort of drop into conversation or how long is your commute to work. And it seemed that pretty much everyone was between... 20 and 40 minutes is most people's drive into work yeah so that's why we aimed for it to be 
why I'm commuting to work per episode. Very Great. good, yeah. God, that's so, so you've got no plans then, uh, like the airline pilot guy show, or, or how we're getting now, actually, to be fair, uh, <laughs> extending to sort of two and a half, three hour long show? <laughs> we think, struggle with 20 minutes. Yeah, no, I, think, I think that would be a bit heavy for some of the uh, subjects. <laughs> well, It'd be good point. if you were using it to help yourself get to sleep. Right. Uh, yeah. I'm sure it would work for that. Yeah. No, 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 they don't need another one. They've already got our show for that. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> it's the way they, Now, I, I have to say, uh, praise indeed for here because the legend that is Captain Al, who, who who is the le- as say we call him the legend that is Captain Al, and uh, uh, from this man especially, this is praise indeed. I have to say that the A320 podcast is awesome. Well done, guys. Wow. Now he is an a uh, he is uh, what does he fly? Is it an A320? He's uh, Al flies. He's flying a 320, 321, and a 330. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Yeah. So I mean that is in, indeed uh, praise. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna uh, now go to uh, some of the questions much. in yeah. the chat room if that's okay with you. So a great question. Yeah. from Tony we can always rely on Tony uh, for these questions it says question for Matt and Andy if you could change one thing uh, from the A320 design what would it be go on, you go the auto thrust system okay so exp- <laughs> explain to the to, to the moron like like me what what is it that that it is and what what problem does it cause why, why would you like to change um, it it'll quite often do very strange things when you expect it to go to idle, it'll just chuck a little bit more power on. And then when you want it to add more power on, it just sits at idle. It, it's a very... I haven't got the bottom yet of why it mm. does it. I mean, there's, the, there's something that changed on the approach, doesn't it, below 3,000 feet? Mm. Changes to that soft approach mode where it's a bit... Yeah. It's what's the word? It's a bit soft around the edges and a bit floppy. But I'd love to change it because the Boeing is is on the point. I've, I've, he's maybe given Boeing praise as an Airbus pilot. But they auto, the auto thrust system is fantastic on that, and I'd like that to be on the Airbus, and it'd be perfect for me. Yeah, I think, yeah, that is quite. Sometimes it can be sluggish. Yeah. For me, I would probably change. Uh, I was really disappointed when they brought the Neo out. Have you flown the Neo yet? Not yet. I flew the. I have flown the Neo, and. Uh, I was just so disappointed when they announced it and it's going to have exactly the same flight deck as the old 320. I wanted an A350 flight deck in there with all the big screens and all the uh, horizontal projections. So I was a bit disappointed. So if I could change it, I'd put the 350 flight deck into the 320. Buy me. There we go. Well, <laughs> ho- hopefully your airline might buy some of those. You never know. <laughs> all the three. The, the, actually, the, uh, the have you guys had a chance to uh, sort of look over the Neo to see what uh, the difference, all the major differences are with that aircraft? Yeah, I've I've flown the Neo. So Ooh, have you? Yeah. Um, and we've done a couple of podcasts yeah, on the differences as well. There's two episodes on that. Oh right. And uh, <laughs> if you've got any A320 pilots that listen in, we've got some deep technical knowledge that isn't in any of the manuals. There's some of our secret top tips of the Neo there as well. So, so come like on. You're selling it yourself. Yeah, it's that's great. It? <laughs> yeah. So what, what, what's, uh, the, well, you know, the, obviously the, the both aircraft had the, the differences the, between the Neo and the, the, uh, oh, the original A320. So what's, what's the favorite then? I mean, I mean, you guys obviously flown the, uh, the, you know, the, th- the 320 um, more than you have the Neo. Is there a, a favourite between the two, or is the Neo just that little bit more better? It's not really any difference to us. It's got new engines that are much more fuel efficient, um, and they sound completely different. But other than that, there's a couple of minor system changes um, that you don't really notice. Otherwise, they're identical, to be honest, which is the disappointing thing. We were hoping that they would have this new A350-style flight deck, but they are pretty much identical yeah uh, Richard King in the chat room is actually asking do you simplify um, do, do you simplify the manual or are you literally quoting verbatim no it's all well, all well probably we normally read the section of the manual and then explain it mm. yeah right yeah I see so, so, Depen- so it depends on the subject doesn't it some of them it's so wordy in um, in our in the FCOM that you couldn't just read it out because no one would absorb the information so sometimes we change it and make it simplified into almost bullet points other times we do read parts of it out don't we so yeah. it's a mixture really and a lot of the episodes as well it's a part of the fcom part of the flight crew techniques manual as it's called now mm. a bit of qrh in there as well it mixes it all in together so a bit about where things all start for you guys and we'll start off with you uh, matt 
Uh, where did the uh, the aviation um, sort of bug start with you? Um, I decided I wanted to be a pilot when I was about seven. Um, <laughs> oh, well. That seems to be a common theme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then as soon as I was old enough, I joined the Air Cadets, which I don't know if you've spoken that, about that before, mm. um, that we have in the UK. So I joined that and uh, did some flying experience with them. Then I got a, a job working at Pan's Hangar. I don't know if any of you know Pan's Hangar Airport. Mm, it's gone, yes. fortunately. Mm. But I worked there uh, from the age of 13, washing planes, refueling planes, and uh, doing all the odd jobs around. Got my private pilot's license. Um, then I went out to America to do my uh, hour building, did my mole changing rating there, and then came back to the UK to do all my ground school for the uh, airline transport pilot's license. Did my uh, CPL and IR at Bristol, which has also gone... In fact, every training school I've ever used has gone bust. Yes. Since. Oh, oh dear. Um, <laughs> and um, <clears throat> and um, then from there, I was uh, fortunate enough to get uh, a job pretty much straight away. So at 23, um, I did my flight rating on A320. That was back in 2007. And uh, been with the same airline ever since. Got my command in 2013. And... Here I am now. Wow! And uh, let's throw let's throw the question ac- ac- across the table there. What's uh, what's your path? Um, you... Well, I can't remember when I decided I want to be a pilot. It's something I've always wanted to do since I was a kid. Um, but I had a previous career before I went into flying. I went off to uni, um, studied civil engineering, and I worked as a civil engineer for four years. Wow! Um, probably that's probably where my love of technical knowledge comes from. Mm-hmm. Because um, that was a very technical subject. Yeah, I worked on all sorts of things at the Olympic Park for the 2012 Olympics. I did a lot of work on there. Yeah, and then I went down more of the modern route. I went to uh, CTC. Yep. Oh yeah. Um, or L3 as it's called now. I think it was. Uh, yeah. It was different how they did it back then. It was straight out of New Zealand. Uh, I did my New Zealand PPL first, and then flew for 100 hours all around New Zealand, getting myself into all sorts of scrapes and corners mm. that I shouldn't have been in. <laughs> um, but it was a good grounding, really. Uh, it's always good to scare yourself in an aeroplane when and survive. Right. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, just like Matt, first job I got was straight into the airline that I'm at now. I was 25 at the time. Uh, I've been there for six and a half years now. And I actually got my command two and a half months ago. Oh, wow. wow. So, well done. Yeah. Well so, done. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That, that is good going. <laughs> so, obviously, you, you, obviously you're... you're presumably both type rated on the A320, given that that is what uh, your podcast is about. Um, but yeah. uh, Lane Street is asking the chat room, do, do you have any other type ratings? Not actual type ratings, no. We both um, privately do some simulator work on the 737. You do 75 as I do well, the 75 and the 74, 330 as well, and the 320 and 73, yeah. So... If- Basically, if people want to just have a fun ride out in a full motion simulator or if people have got an uh, interview coming up or an assessment, mm-hmm. then we do things like that with people in interview prep. So. so we've got a good work and knowledge of other aircraft. We just don't have proper type ratings on them. Okay. Do you guys do any uh, kind of GA flying, you know, um, out and around either the weekends or when you do have time off, do you do any GA flying on uh, private stuff? I think our wives would kill us if we spent any more time. Yeah, we spent doing podcast or working in the sim, and then it's back to work. So yeah, so we've got to try and curb it a bit because yeah. Um, <laughs> the last time I saw my wife, I'm going to see my wife tonight, and I haven't seen her since last Wednesday. Oh my goodness! Oh. Right, okay, yes. Yeah. I, I think that's a common theme, though, is that you have yeah. to have very understanding <laughs> wives if you do podcasts <laughs> and yeah. also yeah. aviation flying. I think uh, 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 Mr. Bell is asking a great question. In the chat yeah, Rick. He said, uh, f- uh, "Do you guys have company-specific systems manuals, or are your systems manuals direct from Airbus?" Good question. A bit of both, actually. Yeah. So I mean, presum- pre- presumably F-com podcast, which... podcast-wise, presumably you're you're actually operating from what like airline operator manuals as opposed to. Um, we so... we go white tail for the uh, podcast. Okay. And what so does that mean? Sorry. So white tail is just essentially just a bog standard aircraft because we try to cover there's there's a lot of variations in systems that can be fit, especially uh, cargo fire suppression. Yeah. Uh, the A321 as well, we try and cover the slight differences there. 
as well. Yeah. Uh, the 18 again is slightly different from the 19 and uh, 20. So we try and cover all of them and try and steer away from our specific stuff because we do have uh, at our airline there's a few procedures we do that are, mm. are quite different from Airbus's own procedures. So we just try and keep it level. But as a as pilots for our airline, then, but you do have manuals for both. So there's the the main flight crew operating manual, the Airbus issue, mm. and then each airline issues its own manuals on how they interpret some of those yeah. procedures. So the uh, airline you fly for, obviously you do um, lots of sectors within Europe and stuff, and you obviously have a very busy flying uh, routine. Are there any particular airports in Europe that you kind of see on on you know on your to do list for the day and think, oh no, really? <laughs> a few. Uh, <laughs> it depends. Yeah, a lot of them are weather dependent. Yeah, I love sure. going into Split and Dubrovnik when the weather's nice. They're one of my favourites, but they're yeah, also nice. probably yeah. two of the worst when the weather's not very nice. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. yeah, I'd agree. Uh, Lisbon as well. That can be a little bit tricky when uh, the wind's blowing from the northwest as well. That can get yeah. a bit spicy and interesting. Yeah. Eagle-eyed viewers will notice that uh, we were being dialed up by a certain Captain Al. So uh, brace yourselves. The what happens here, gents? If you've never had, if you've been lucky enough never to watch the drivel that we put out, um, <laughs> is whenever Captain Al appears, basically the tone of the show will now rapidly deteriorate. So um, just brace yourself uh, for a so moment. You haven't heard our podcast out to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. They keep asking us to do some. I keep refusing. <laughs> It'd be too long. I am being exceptionally well behaved today i'm very grateful thank you i'm 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 a man of nervous disposition shall we say and well, you are uh, now you're yeah. dialing al i am dialing al let's see what happens i don't know if he's gonna before we he press on he, he may not answer, answer. i did want to put out a, a christmas blooper selection but i did say that all of mine would just be a constant beep right okay yeah. just one <laughs> solid yeah yeah we had a christmas episode that was very similar very to that, similar so yeah. Was, yeah yeah absolutely so just give us a moment uh, i think we have the blue ring of death as i like to call it uh, that is captain al but enough about his toilet habits uh it's, um, <laughs> are you there captain yeah. al I am indeed. It'll have to be audio only because oh, I'm in the like, car. That yeah, okay. be very dark. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Oh, yeah. Okay. That'll be that'll be like having um, Don Sebastian on then when we. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pretty bad. Hang on. I'm just opening the window. Can you hear me better? No, stop Hang it. <laughs> so um. So Al, you've been you've been so eager to get on the show, being we've got Matt and Andy on. So uh, come on then, far away. What what have you what are you want to to get off your chest? Well, absolutely. I've I've, I've just been um, driving across the M62. Uh, listening to the show and uh, I just wanted to say to Matt and Andy that I'm a relatively new listener to the A320 podcast but what a rare treat it is to have a slick professional and factual podcast to listen to <laughs> I don't know what to do with that information. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. I will take that as a compliment. Yeah, I yeah. would. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was directed at us, to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, thanks, Al. So, uh, uh, so, so, gents, yeah, so thanks very much for, um, for providing the A320 podcast. Um, it certainly gets my vote of approval. Oh, oh, wow. Thanks very much. Oh, we're glad that uh, you enjoy it. That's what it's for. So, uh, well, I mean, it's always, you know, encouraging, you know, I've, I've flown the thing for 16 years now and, um, you know, it's nice to listen to something and learn something new. So that's great. Fantastic. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thanks very much. That... No, we appreciate you uh, calling in for us. The, the legend, the legend. No, no, is... no problems at all. I mean, Carlos and Matt are waiting, waiting for the punchline here. I, I am a bit, <laughs> yes, I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Matt's fingers hovering yeah, above absolutely. the Absolutely, I'm on the cancel button. Cancel button. Yeah. <laughs> So where are, you, where are you off to anyway, Al? Al, have you been flying or are you you're on your way home? No, no, no. I'm just to, uh, about to check into my summer home. Um, I'm here for a few nights and uh, I'm off relatively early in the morning for a flight down to Parma. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's all it is. I've enjoyed listening to the show. It's been a good show. When it eventually got started. Okay. <laughs> well, we couldn't leave it, could he? Couldn't leave no, it. No, he couldn't. Just it was all going too nicely, just... wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, you can always I thought rel- I might be able to make the hour and a half journey to the hotel without the show actually starting. Right. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yes, I appreciate your uh, kind support, oh, as always. It's always so, nice to hear yes. from you, Al. Thanks, Al. Really uh, is. <laughs> it's okay. So, um, uh, yes, yes, it's Matt, Matt and Ghost. Shall Carl's... I bugger off now, then? Uh, yes, yes, <laughs> if you wouldn't mind. That would be great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> night, night. Keep 
<laughs> the good work. Thank Cheers, Al. Thanks, Thanks very much. Cheers. <laughs> Take care. Oh, Bye-bye. dear. Well, that was slightly less frightening than usual. Uh, it was. <laughs> yeah, actually, it he's, was on, he's on good behaviour yeah, tonight, yeah. actually. Uh, yeah, so here's a question. Yeah, so I think we've done that. Um, it's um, yeah, the, A lot of people are very grateful, actually, in the chat room that um, uh, he, he was uh, in his car and nowhere else. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's all good. Well, look, guys, uh, seriously, thank you so very much for joining us on the the show today it's been a real honor to have you on um if you aren't uh, familiar with the show then why on earth aren't you it's a fantastic show and uh, tell them how they get hold of your podcast how do they get to listen to it that's your part Matt. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, well you can head over if you've got uh, itunes then just search a320 and uh, it should come up at the top there or you can go to our website a320podcast.com where we've got all our episodes and we've got the facebook page yeah and twitter it's all uh, a320 <laughs> podcast if you search for that on facebook or twitter we're on uh, all the media social media uh, yeah and much. we're trying to add more because there's some things in some of the podcasts uh, like the one putting out monday on ground speed many there'll be a couple of little bits that go up on the uh, facebook page a few diagrams just to make life a bit easier to understand uh, what's going on with that particular system. Yeah, and if you need to contact us, you can always send us an email, info at a320podcast. And, uh, dot, we... com. dot com. Dot yes. com, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and you can uh, speak to us on there. We're always happy to... Uh... the only social media forum that you're not on is pornpicks.com. Oh, oh, stop no. it! <laughs> is he still there? Yeah, really he's him. still there. He's hanging around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, Matt, so Matt, Andy, what uh, before, before we um, before we sort of start to close the show up, what uh, what are the future plans for you guys? What have you got? Um, you know, what, where do you want to go from some from where you are now? Well, we're sort of moving. We've had a few ideas about certain things. Uh, we're certainly thinking about moving into a few not we're sort of video podcasts of just a few procedures and stuff like that. Because we've got access to the Sims, we're thinking about producing some things that people can actually see mm. instead of just listening to us. Um, and then we're also going to be moving into sort of uh, actual documents, sort of the, um, what's that, the idiot's guide to and stuff like yeah. that, just to try and break it all down even further. We just want to make everybody's life easy who flies an aeroplane, really. Yeah. Mm. And I think, I think that's the one thing that certainly from, and I, I think Al will definitely uh, agree with this thing, is one of the nice things uh, uh, about what, what you're doing is it is literally even seasoned um, pilots are, f- are finding an interesting way of just like almost keeping themselves like refreshed and up to date, uh, you know, with the aircraft that, that they're flying. So, I mean, muchos, uh, muchos uh, nods to you there for, for, yeah. for doing exactly that. I mean, it, it can't be an easy Absolutely. podcast I to put... Agree. I couldn't agree more, really. I mean, in my limited experience, um, airline pilots tend to form into sort of two groups when it comes to knowledge. There are those who want to sort of squirrel things away and keep it for themselves and sort of earn brownie points at the appropriate time. And there are those who want to share everything and let other people benefit mm. from their experience or their knowledge, um, you know, so that it's for the greater good of everyone. And quite clearly, you know, the A320 podcast is going, you know, down that route mm. trying to achieve, yeah. you know, helping everybody out. And that, that's brilliant. So, yeah, so, yeah, well, that's exactly what we want, you know, yeah. share the information and try and help everybody's knowledge to be improved. And we have a few, I don't know if you've seen, we've got a few um, accident investigation episodes and good. they're good because obviously Ooh. you've learned from other people's mistakes. So if one person listens to one of those episodes and could help them out, then, you know, who knows? Could save an accident from well, happening. Well, you never know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, this is the thing. So, what about your futures, then, guys? Within the airlines, with your flying, are you uh, you're going to stick stick to to flying the sort of short haul stuff? Or would, you, would you like to move into kind of the larger long haul? The long haul stuff, yeah. Not oh. me personally. I like being home every night, so yeah. I, I like the short haul lifestyle. It's very tiring, but you do obviously get all your time off at home, which yeah. is what suits me. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've got no desire at all to do long haul. I would like to fly the 757 at some point in my career. Yeah. <laughs> I will try and find a way to do that. <laughs> You're right there, Al. <laughs> 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 uh, that's it. Your education required. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Uh, I, might, I might just actually might just add on to that that uh, that, that that very soon a certain. Al of Captain yes. will be will be flying said Boeing product. 
He but will. That's that all is I'm true. Saying. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah, all I'm absolutely. Saying. Yeah. He'll just not, find not the seven five seven tractor. I will. <laughs> <laughs> no fair point. Yes. Okay. You know, the John Deere of the air. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes. It's um. Yes. It's uh. So now we so, have so we, one last question, haven't we? On. Yeah. Well, we've got one last question for both both you guys, Matt and Andy, before uh, before we finish the show, and it's a question that we ask. Yeah. We, we ask all of our yeah. pilots uh, that we have on the show. In fact, actually, it's such a familiar question. I'm pretty sure that Captain Al could ask it. So uh, oh, take it away, I sir. Him. <laughs> <laughs> that is brave. That is. Brave. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm regretting the decision already. <laughs> Go yeah. on. So, um, uh, Andy and Matt, um, what is your favourite night stop? No, line? no. Uh, <laughs> that is not the question <laughs> that we asked. <laughs> no, no. Um, if you had the opportunity to fly an aircraft, whether it's one that's current, in the future, or, or deceased, what aircraft would you most like to fly? Or Military or commercial, yeah, whatever anything. choice, yeah. anything. Yeah, living or dead. <laughs> Tristar. Tristar? Oh, no, don't oh, tell it. Oh, no. He is my new really? best friend. <laughs> oh, what have you done? <laughs> oh, he, I, I'll tell you what. Uh, yeah, you're welcome here anytime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, anytime. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's going to start hoovering the red carpet even now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Yeah, so uh, there we go. So why would you I'd want to buy the Death Star? <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, what, what about you, Matt? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'd love to have a go on the 7.5. I think that, from everyone I know that's flown it, they always say that's really nice to fly. So I'd probably like to have a go on that. Um, and obviously, something new and shiny. It'd be nice to just have a go on a 350 or 380 or something yeah. like that, probably. Something well, a bit... there is hope. There is hope. <laughs> <laughs> so, listen, guys, thank you very much for joining us on the show. It's been a lot of fun. I hope we haven't put you off live podcasting in any way, shape, or form. Seven, five, seven. Yeah, it's, it's been, been really good. good. Yeah. <laughs> Al is still reeling from shock. He's horrified. <laughs> The 757. You're right there, Al. Do you need to lie down? <laughs> Actually, Myla, Myla's just put in the chat room that she can't wait for Al to join the Boeing family. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I think hell's going to freeze over first, I think. Uh, <laughs> and obviously, Thomas Mandrake in the chat room, he's, he's obviously also a, a, a fabulous chap because he's also has put TriStar rules. Oh, what's wrong with you all? <laughs> Honestly. <sighs> Direct I mean, let's... control. That's all you need to know about the <laughs> TriStar. <laughs> well, well yeah. that's true. Yeah. Let, let's look at the 7.5 and 7.6. Anyway, can we, dial, can we press <laughs> the... Um, press the... That amount of time and that amount of money designing an aeroplane only to end up having it so mal man manufactured that there's a step to the flight deck, whether it's up or down. I mean, they couldn't get it right, could they? I mean, they had, had the step on the 7.5 and they thought, all right, well, we'll try and make it a level floor on the 7.6. No, we've gone the other way. <laughs> well, uh, so there you are, gentlemen. This is your, right, your first introduction there to... It's like having a blind patron decorator come around. <laughs> Is having one of his rants now. Yeah, yeah, okay. Right, yeah. Yeah, Wrap I think that show, anyway, Matt. before <laughs> before we get arrested or something like that, it is time well, to bring... That, if there's that much of a problem, just have a ram. Excellent. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, so, um, uh, Nev, uh, please rescue us, please. It's time to bring this Nev, show to Nev, a Nev, bring the show to a close. Any airplane oh. that needs an elevator to go from the main cabin to the flight deck... <laughs> Right, okay. Anyway, uh, anyway. social media feeds for our own show. It is www.plaintalkinguk.com. It's facebook.com forward slash plaintalkinguk. And our Twitter handle is at plaintalkinguk. We love to receive your audio and worded word-related <sighs> feedback. And if you'd like to email the show, you do so on podcast at plaintalkinguk.com. And this week, just for a change, we'll let Nev finish the show. Yeah. Yes. Well, thanks so much indeed, uh, guys, and especially uh, Matt and Andy. Uh, been really, really fantastic and a great insight to your jobs, uh, especially now you've both got your commands as well. That, that, that's great. And I think uh, the AC20 podcast is absolutely superb. So uh, thank you very much indeed for doing all you do. And thanks for coming on the show today. You're very welcome. We loved it. We really enjoyed yeah, it. It's yeah, it's been great. So that's, the, that's your lot, guys. Thanks very much. We'll see you all again. I think we're recording next Friday, next Friday as per yeah. usual, 7 p.m. if you want to catch the live show. And you catch the live show on podcast at Plain Talking UK. No, you don't. That's the email address. It's, it's <laughs> youtube.com forward slash Plain Talking UK forward slash live. So that's it from all of us this week. Take care, everyone. Everybody say goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.